It's the College of Complexes, and if you just wandered in, it'll be $3. We are... Oh, hey, hey. You have to get your name. We don't have to But, aside from the $3 dues, we have a couple of other rules. And those are one fool at a time, which means the speaker, usually the one with a microphone, and should be heard, and the others should be quiet about it. Oh, yeah. All right. I love doing this. And some people like to interrupt, like that green clad fellow going to the exit there. All right. Uh, aside from that, we have one other rule, and that is that we do not insult anybody here personally oh. or their mothers. How about their fathers? Aside from that, we are uh, pretty uh, free uh, with our remarks and so on. Uh, what we we have an agenda. Uh, we start off uh, with announcements, uh, and then we move on to our speaker, who tonight is James Gira, uh, who will be re representing uh, law enforcement against prohibition. Uh, he'll be telling us about uh, drugs and, or the various substances that are illegal and, uh, and why and uh, what good, uh, why we should be illegalized them. Uh, The loss of the people or the loss of the capitalists? Oh, you want the lights out? No, I think we'd be all right, Charlie. You can see if we're good, I think. Well, we, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my, my name is Jim Hurock, and I want to thank uh, the College of Complexes for the opportunity to come out and speak with you tonight. I want to thank Karina, Tim, Charles, uh, uh, Ron, uh, for, for the invitation and uh, the kind introduction. Uh, they, they, when they call, they ask me, uh, you know, if you're going to speak at the uh, College of Complexes, do you have to have any? Do you have any complexes? I said, I have plenty. So, uh, so they confirmed uh, my reservation. Uh, well, I'm here to, to speak to you about uh, my favorite subject, uh, the war on drugs, to, to tell you just a, a brief uh, piece about myself. I'm a former drug prosecutor in Chicago. Uh, in the early 70s, uh, I worked in the state's attorney's office of Cook County uh, and, and I helped write Illinois' Constitution in 1970. Uh, I um, am president of a church group. I've never used an illicit drug. Uh, I ran across law enforcement against prohibition uh, in uh, a long uh, a series of activities fighting against the war on drugs, and I saw here were a group of law enforcers who were really on the same side of the issue as I was. The people who are members of law enforcement against prohibition are the former leaders of the war on drugs. They're former uh, undercover narcotics agents, DEA agents, uh, police officers, uh, prison wardens, judges, and prosecutors such as myself. Well, I'm against the war on drugs because it, it, it doesn't work. And the three points that I want to leave you with tonight is, is number one, the war on drugs, which was designed to save our kids, doesn't work. In fact, it's the most efficient way to put more drugs uncontrolled and unregulated everywhere. The second point I want to leave you with tonight is that not only does the war on drugs not work uh, with regard to saving the kids from drugs or adults from drugs, but it's also basically the heart of nearly any crisis you can name in America. The problem with guns, gangs, crime, prisons, taxes, deficits, aids, health care, trade benefits, corruption, no money for schools, job programs, the funding of terrorism. All of those subjects are made worse instead of better 
by our wonderful war on drugs. The third point that I want to leave you with tonight, besides just one, it doesn't work, to which the heart of any crisis you can name. Point three, why does something that has failed so mightily, why has it lasted so long? And the answer to that is because the bad guys are in favor of the war on drugs. Al Capone in this city was in favor of the prohibition of alcohol because it gave him a monopoly over the substance that people wanted. That the cartels in Mexico and Colombia and around the world that, that, that bring us our drugs are in favor of prohibition. So the question is, why should the good guys be on the same side of the issue as the bad guys? And it makes no sense. Uh, so, uh, here, here, here's my little introduction. I kind of changed my introduction. Usually it says the war on drugs is the heart of uh, uh, most crises in, in America. And I changed it because I was just recently uh, speaking as a guest in Mexico City where the violence, of course, is just epidemic. They, they have some 50,000 people killed. Uh, the corruption is so bad that they're taking the guns away from local police officers and they're trying to federalize uh, the national police force. Uh, another guest speaker was the former uh, uh, foreign minister for Mexico, who is now a professor in the United States um, um, in, in um, Cast Castaneda, is his name. And uh, he said, if we were going to have the same federal protection we had in Mexico as we have in Colombia, instead of 35,000 federal police officers, we would need 400,000. Uh, obviously, like the problem was a little short, Mexico is even much more. More, uh, um, but anyway, the, the second place I was recently uh, was in Vienna. In, in Vienna, the uh, uh, United Nations Commission on Narcotics Drugs met, and they meet once a year. This was their 55th session. And, and I was there, uh, of course, to call for an end to the war on drugs uh, because of the, the, the many evils that it produces. And yet, the people who were there from around the country uh, approved a resolution that was approved, introduced by the United States that was celebrating the 100th anniversary of the first opium prohibition treaty in the world. And, 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 and that was passed in, in 1912, so 2012 we were having the 100 year anniversary. In the resolution sponsored by the United States it said, uh, where is this and where is drugs are bad and where is we got to do this and do that. And, the, and when you get through with the whereas, as you get down to the operative part of the resolution, and it said, wherefore, we want to reaffirm the three prohibitionist treaties of 1961, 1971, and 1988. Well, it, it's the United Nations, which is the fountainhead of drug prohibition for the world, that requires the member states of the United Nations to put in place prohibition laws such as we have in the United States and everywhere else in the world. So anyway, for the, uh, that's a long explanation for the title, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so, so when I was at, at, at I was uh, on stage in Mexico City, and uh, a guy Antonio Mazzatelli, who was the head of Central America, uh, uh, Mexico, and the Caribbean, uh, and he got up and spoke before I did, and he said, "Well, we can't legalize drugs because uh, we, we're going to have we're going to have even greater health problems. We're going to have drugs everywhere." And I got up and, and spoke next, and I couldn't resist. I said, well, you know, we, we put in place this United Nations Al Capone drug policy uh, of prohibition. Uh, and as a result of it, we've had 50,000 people killed in Mexico. And so how is that good for the public health? And I said, why we're here, and some 38 speakers from around the world were collected here in, in Mexico City in February. Uh, and I, I said, why we're here, we have had 15 tons of meth seized. So how is that good? What is it about the United Nations drug policy that accumulates 15 tons of drugs in one place? The previous uh, total uh, seizures of methamphetamine for the previous year in Mexico was like three tons. Outrageous. Anyway, back to the uh, slide presentation. Uh, nothing I say here is supportive of drug use. I'm opposed to drug use, but I'm even more opposed to the war on drugs uh, because uh, it, it just uh, is the heart of, of nearly any crisis you can name. But as I said, uh, Al Capone was in favor of prohibition, and this is Pablo Escobar, of course, uh, in favor of prohibition. Uh, we're now in our 40th year since Nixon on June 17th, uh, 40 years ago, declared uh, uh, actually, uh, 2011 was the 40th year, so we're now coming up on the 41st year. Uh, and, but the trouble with the war on drugs is it doesn't work. 
And in evidence of that, here's a nice slide from Chicago, where it looks like a snow fort. This is all cocaine uh, seized by uh, previous uh, uh, police officers and our superintendent standing there. And I like the way it engulfs the uh, podium and the sign Chicago, because that's exactly what the war on drugs has done to us here in Chicago. Uh, and if that's not enough drugs, Exhibit B to prove that the war on drugs doesn't work, here's 40,000 pounds of cocaine seized in one seizure uh, off the, the coast of California. You know, oftentimes you think, uh, you know, the police fall out and put all the drugs on the table and they say, look at how wonderful uh, we're, we're doing and how, how, uh, how much drugs we've seized. The bigger the seizure of drugs, the greater the evidence of the failure. Because you can't seize tons of drugs unless you have a policy in place that produces tons of drugs. And 40,000 pounds evidence of that. So, uh, and if you want to uh, uh, skip to 2010, 75 tons uh, of drugs seized in one bus. The major dragnet seizes 25,000 tons, 2,300 people arrested. Doesn't matter. We seized drugs by the ton and we prosecuted by the gram. How big is a gram? It's one of these things is a gram. They prosecute this stuff by the gram. You get five of these uh, of crack cocaine, you can go to prison forever. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. Now, uh, I just made a new slide for today because uh, here just uh, a couple of days ago here in Chicago, we had a ton of uh, marijuana seized on the west side. And, and they say that the street value of just one ton of this stuff is $4.8 million. We wonder why the kids are dropping out of school, joining a gang in Chicago. 90% of the kids are dropping out of high school and many of the Chicago high schools to go into the drug business. But we tell them don't do drugs. And then we slide a pot of gold next to the choice that we tell them not to take. And I say, geez, I wonder why they're doing that. And we have a superintendent here in Chicago, uh, Mc McCarthy, who's going to come up with a new gang strategy. Well, what's the new gang strategy? He's doing the same thing we did before. More police. We're going we're to put the cops on the dots. We're going to use anticipatory policing. Uh, we're gonna, going to uh, uh, you know, put the, the, the data into this computer and find out uh, which gang is on what corner. We tore down the project buildings, and when we had the project buildings in Chicago, we at least knew that this building was the gangster disciples, this one was the Latin Kings, and everybody had their little nook and corner. Once they tore those down, they dispersed these gangs out into low-rise housing into the neighborhood. So now you've got one guy in the same building as another guy of opposite gangs. So now they're fighting over who's going to control that corner uh, or that street or that little nook and corner. So we have created a monster. And yet politically in this town, Mayor Daly refused to address drug policy reform. Tony Preckwinkle, for the first time, is now at least saying something that makes sense, so we can't lock up all these people and spend all this money, so she at least says, well, let's legalize drugs, to her meaning, well, let's issue some pot tickets. We arrest 23,000 people a year in Chicago, it costs us $78 million a year, 90% or more of those cases are dismissed after the kids are in jail a couple of days. We give them a criminal record. They can't get a job. They can't get a Pell Grant. They can't work for the post office. They can't get a job. And, and, and we, we destroy the neighborhoods where these kids are, are, are returned. Uh, it, it's just absolutely mind-boggling that, that our new mayor and our new police superintendent haven't jumped on the bandwagon of, of uh, 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 Commissioner Grishy. Uh, uh, who was proposed, uh, along with Richard Mell, along with uh, um, Munoz, was it? I forget the, the names, but there's about five uh, uh, aldermen that, that stood up and said we need at least pot tickets to it, at least reduce the amount of money we're throwing away. But back to uh, the war on drugs that uh, doesn't work. Here's uh, 1.5 million in heroin, massive drug best, 5 million in cash also seized, uh, the largest of the year. Uh, it, the evidence, if you read the paper, it's everywhere. I mean, it, it, to put a few slides up means nothing compared. Mexico City, I mentioned, where, where we, we, uh, uh, we just seized 15 tons, they produced 21,500 tons of marijuana a year. In December of, of 2010, we seized 10 car, box cars of marijuana, you may recall, uh, in, in Chicago, is 10, 10 tons of marijuana. 10 tons against 21,000 tons is nothing, absolutely 
useless, and it's tons, and we prosecute it by the gram. Idiotic. Absolutely idiotic. So let me say uh, pro prohibition is, is, is the gateway drug, not, not marijuana. Uh, all right, here's uh, turning success into failure. So our, our, our sheriff of Cook County says, well, look at this great seizure we've had of all this marijuana. Here's 5,500 pounds, two and a half, what's it, two, three, almost three, six, three tons. Uh, and, and so uh, the Cook County Sheriff says, we're going to destroy these drugs. Well, if you were the drug cartel operator and they had seized your drugs, what would you want them to do with it? And burn it, sure, right, because we don't want that stuff used in competition with us. So we've got the government working for us to put us in complete exclusive control of the drug outlet. So even, even uh, the Sun Times has the sense to say it's absolutely ridiculous to, 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 uh, uh, to, to be destroying these drugs when we could be using it for medical marijuana. And, 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 and this, this article, it really just basically looks like uh, it says that stupid thing to do about marijuana, but this needs a new label. Uh, the Sun-Times editorially basically in June of 2010 said let's end the drug war because it doesn't work. When, when we, will we accept that America's war on drugs is over, we've lost, and it's time to get real about our drug problems. Medical marijuana should be legalized, pot more generally should be decriminalized, and the carnage in our streets and in ex Mexico beg that we rethink uh, the approach to the sale and the use of, of more serious drugs as well. That's the best editorial Chicago has thus far produced, and they're right. Well, Leaf, Leaf says that the war on drugs doesn't work. It's the most effective way to put more drugs uncontrolled and, and, and uh, unregulated everywhere. When, when you prohibit a drug, drug, ironically, you give up the right to, to regulate and control it. And some drugs are, are obviously too dangerous to leave uncontrolled and unregulated. I have a cousin who's an attorney in Chicago, or, or rather Florida. He has a son who attends the law school in, in uh, Denver, Colorado. He graduates from law school, he's on the way to a job interview, uh, he imbibes cocaine to get up for the interview, overdoses and kills himself. So it isn't just the, the mope on the street, it's, it's educated people who do dumb things. But when you prohibit something, it makes it harder to protect people from themselves. When I was growing up, I'm going to make an admission, I came, I suppose, so I have to be careful here. <laughs> I, I, I was in college, and and, uh, and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to find out uh, what this drinking beer is about. And I was, I was raised in a strict environment, no 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 beer, no beer <coughs> underage, of course. I was still underage when I got to college, and I had two grandfathers that were alcoholics. So so I thought, well, you know, I'm going to try this beer stuff. So, you know, if you had a six-pack of beer on a Saturday night, and you don't feel so good the next morning, well... When you do the same thing the next Saturday, you know that you're going to feel the same way because the government controls and regulates how much booze can go into the can. So that even in the experimentation of youth, you can be protected if government puts in place rules that control and regulate things and let the public know what those controls and regulations are. But anyone who's using illicit drugs in this prohibition criminalized environment that exists today is using drugs in the dark because even though you may buy the substance from the same person, somebody who you've gotten to know because you've used them weekendly for whatever period of time or daily, whatever, uh, it, that person himself doesn't know what's in the stuff. Who's deciding what goes into the package? The cartels, the street gangs, what kind of drugs? Where will they be sold? How old do you have to be to buy them? How old do you have to be to sell them? How much is it going to cost? What is it going to be cut with? What is the purity of it? All of those things are delegated to the bad guys because of the, the current prohibition system. So if, if you wanted to come up with something that could really make things bad drug-wise for the world, the single most effective thing that you could do is support prohibition. And all of our, our, our politicians, Republican, Democrats, and Independents, historically have supported the war on drugs because to a politician, he gets up there and says, I'm going to save your kids from drugs. Drugs are bad. Drugs are evil. We're going to protect our society from them. We're going to show them who's boss. We're going to put in place some serious penalties. And if they use drugs, we're going to send them away. We're going to take back our streets 
and, 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 and be tough, right? Sounds good. The problem is it creates just the opposite. You can't require a label. You can't say the drugs are prohibited, uh, but don't exceed the recommended dosage on the label. You give up the right to put a label or to require a warning uh, on the label. So let's move on. Why doesn't the war on drugs work? And the answer is, it's the money, honey. Uh, here's a Chicago headline from 1992 that says $7 billion addiction to drug trade in Chicago. Seven billion. It's, it's been said the second largest business in the world is, is the sale of illicit drugs. The second largest business in the world. The, the biggest cash crop in the United States is marijuana. And, and yet, it's still in place. Um, if, if that wasn't enough money, here's a drug dealer came to the United States, a Mexican drug dealer, and, and they arrest him, they know he's a drug dealer, so they thought, well, we'll go back and see what we can find at his place back home. They get there, they find in the bedroom uh, uh, $207 million in cash, all $100 bills, waist deep. Reminds me of the Scrooge cartoons when I was a little kid. You know, they, 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 when you get that much money, you don't count it, you weigh it. You know how hard it is to put two hundred and seven million dollars under the mattress? Uh. <laughs> I mean, you have to laugh at it, right? I mean, it's 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 our public policy. The United States is the one who has exported prohibition around the world. We insist that the other nations put it in place. We insist that the United Nations put in place these three prohibition treaties. We just introduced a resolution to reaffirm. The Secretariat of the United Nations submitted a report that was 30 pages long showing that drug use was, was worse around the world. He introduced another 30-page report and said drug trafficking is up everywhere around the world. And, and then the, the United Nations Office of Crime and Drugs introduces a report by the executive director that says we're now spending $1.04 billion a year in the United Nations drug programs and yet we still have more drugs, more drug dealing, more of all these problems everywhere in the world. Wherefore, let's reaffirm these three treaties. I mean, it's lunacy to, to sit there and see what they do. It, it's like, uh, it's like uh, you say, it's raining outside, it's raining outside, it's raining outside. Um, and then, uh, wherefore, put the umbrellas away. It, it's, it's just so nonsensical, I can't tell you. So we, we tried putting uh, various programs into place, and you'll recognize many of these things we've done in Chicago. We, we put metal detectors in front of the schools. We put the drug dogs in the schools. We we, we installed cul-de-sacs. We put cameras in the public way. Uh, we put radar balloons in, in the Caribbean. We, we put the Plan Colombia in place, uh, Plan Merida now in Mexico, $400 million a year for each of those things. Uh, we, we put DARE officers in the school, but the kids who go through DARE have a higher rate of drug use than those who don't. Uh, we we, we uh, deny kids Pell Grants. Pell Grants. We kick them out of public housing. We deny them public employment. We won't let them into the military. We say, well, let's put up a fence between Mexico and the United States. So the human ingenuity can go over the fence, under the fence, around the fence, and if we can't get that to work, we pay the guy for the, the privilege of passing by. And, and so what we end up doing is corrupting people. We take a kid and we catch him in three controlled sales here uh, in Chicago or anywhere else in the United States, and, we, and, and the copper says to him, now listen, guy, we got you in three controlled sales. And you are going away forever, unless you want to cooperate. We want to know who sold you these drugs. We want to know, are you willing to wear a, a wire? Well, he, you know, I went to school with this guy. Uh, well, he, he, I was raised with him. We played basketball down the block. He, Listen, I don't care about what you, what you know about what relative he is. You're going away unless you're going to wear the wire. And, 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 and tell us who, who sold you these drugs. So. Basically, the message is, forget your fellow man, save yourself, sacrifice the other guy, do it to him, don't do it to me. It's the antithesis of the golden rule, and we wonder why there's no moral fabric. We wonder why somebody can stand over somebody and pump six bullets into them as they lay on the ground. Because in the war on drugs, it has makes, it made society absolutely valueless, moralless. 
So, um, drug war axiom number two with drug policy, everything works in reverse. So it, it took me a long time to figure this out, but uh, the strategy of the, uh, the National Drug Service Office, the Office of uh, uh, the National Office of uh, uh, Drugs out of Washington, Barry McCaffrey, now it's Gil Curley Council, etc. Uh, they want to keep the price of drugs high, and the reason is because then people won't be able to afford it, there won't be as many people using it, we keep the price of drugs high, and, and what happens now that drug cartels can't make any money, the street gangs aren't making any money, because it costs too much, nobody can afford to buy it. Well, the trouble with that is, anybody who knows anything about economics, is you increase the price of something, you encourage the, the, the supply. The higher the price, the more that, that someone is willing to supply. So as this crazy theory uh, succeeds, the more it fails. The higher the price is, the more drugs you get, well then the price falls back down. So, uh, so, so one of the things uh, that we're doing that's, that's really uh, the opposite of what we should be doing is keeping price high. We should keep prices low. Uh, we say, well, once we've confiscated the drugs, let's destroy them, just so we can take these drugs off the streets and out of society and save the people from them. Well, when you do that, it's the government working for the cartels to ensure that, that they are the only means by which someone can obtain the drugs, and of course, only unlawfully. And then we put anti-drug ads on. Well, let's put on, you know, kids are going to see uh, X number of ads, eight ads uh, per week. Uh, and between the age of 12 and 16 or whatever, they actually make plans to, to see how many of these ads they can get. The problem is that an anti-drug ad is first and foremost a drug ad. Whether you say, do do the drugs, or you say, don't do the drugs, it's bringing drugs to the attention of the kids. And it, and it, and it has turned uh, this country into a national drug disaster. Between, between putting these rules together, <laughs> We, we have just uh, drug dated this, this, this country. When I was a prosecutor in the early 70s, the best heroin you can get in Chicago was 2% was pure. After 40 years of drug war, as you know, you can now in Chicago get 90% pure heroin. 90% instead of 2%. So how has the war on drugs helped us over the last 40 years? We have high school. In, in the area where I live, where the kids in the suburban areas are, are buying heroin and are more able to get it, easier than they can get a six-pack or a package of cigarettes. Because if you go to buy those, the, the dealer is worried about losing his license for selling to some person of that age. What Carol Marine wrote about the kids coming up from Star Rock in LaSalle, Peru, buying uh, heroin on the west side of Chicago. And, and of course, Nobody editorially said, well, we need to legalize uh, heroin or we need to put in place like the Swiss heroin program where the addicts only can come and, and, and get the drug from the government and a consumed regulated, uh, you have to consume an on-premise uh, uh, program which has been very successful in, in Switzerland, which maybe a long time to talk about. But in any event, the, the, the thought I want you to leave you with is, is that with drug policy, everything works in reverse. If you, if you sit down and think about what we do about the drugs, and you come up with an idea, and it sounds great, don't do it. Okay, less funded drug war strategies that work. Well, treatment is, uh, is better than law enforcement, but we historically have given 70% of our money to law enforcement, radar balloons, uh, military, uh, to, to try and uh, eradicate drugs, uh, uh, prevent them from being grown, prevent them from being trans, uh, transmitted, uh, crop uh, substitution programs, and so forth. But tre treatment is, is, is more effective. But even treatment has a, a weakness. And the weakness with treatment is that it's easier to make a new addict than to cure an old one. So people who tell you, well, we need demand reduction. People in the United States shouldn't use drugs. Well, they shouldn't use drugs. But it's the nature of man, uh, for whatever reason, and woman, to, to imbibe. And, and so uh, control and regulation uh, and, and instead of what we're doing now. So uh, it took me a long time to get to point two. Uh, I said a little bit earlier that the war on drugs not only doesn't work for its intended purpose to save us and the kids from drugs, but 
It's also the heart of any of these crises you can name. And basically, any, any crisis you can name other than on the list uh, is, is probably also there. Uh, guns, gangs, crime, prisoners, taxes, deficits, AIDS, health care, trading, balance, corruption, all like school, job programs, funding, terrorism, that email, more over these. The denial of constitutional rights, the, the discriminatory incarceration of minorities. Uh, at Michelle Alexander's book, uh, it's talking about the new Jim Crow, where you can't discriminate against somebody in the United States anymore based on race, creed, color. But if we can convict them of crime, now we have the right to discriminate against them. So what happens if we put in place, say, a law in Illinois that says if you're a minor and you're caught selling crack cocaine on public housing, it's an automatic transfer from juvenile court to adult court. We put a law like that in place. The first 99 people who went to, were automatically transferred to adult court were all black, 100% black. Illinois Supreme Court said, there's nothing disparate about this law. It treats everyone the same. Just happens to guess who lives in public housing. So in, anyway, we've ended up with racial dis disparities. We end up with heavy-handed policing. We ended up, ended up with law enforcement based on informants. And it, it, as a prosecutor, the worst day of my uh, work would be when I would have to flip somebody in a murder case to testify against the shooter because there was nobody alive or witness except the bad guys. And it used to, I, I used to feel bad when I had to make a deal with an armed robber uh, in order to get him to testify against the shooter in the armed robbery to put the shooter in jail. So, okay, you get four years for armed robbery in consideration for your testifying against the guy who was the shooter. And, and, and what we have done with this war on drugs is we have put it into place on every petty, any two-bit arrest. Who sold you the drugs? Where did you get the drugs? And, and then we, when we get that one, then we do the same thing. And it's this bind that leads endlessly and everywhere. So anyway, all of these prices, and I'm going to have to go through fairly quickly here, but uh, Chicago's number two in heroin deaths. And sometimes it's uh, laced with fentanyl, which is a legal drug that has the side effect of paralyzing the respiratory system. So we had like 200 people die on the west side that and when they came with these drugs, uh, they had like, uh, I think, uh, 20 ambulances at one time on the west side. Do you recall that a few years ago? 200 people died. Um, and then here I was telling you about now we're at 90% uh, pure heroin. Uh, meth. Meth is a big thing, right? Uh, we got to clamp down on meth. Well, we had no, in 1997, we had no labs, no meth seizures. So, uh, but then we started to get a few. And, and so the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, one of the state agencies, puts out this pamphlet, the, the compiler, and says, you know, it's getting bad here. We've got, we're, we're now up to uh, a, a, a thousand uh, arrests, and, and uh, you know, here's uh, how many labs that they see. So we're going to get tough. We're going to increase the penalties and make it the same for meth as we do for, for heroin and cocaine. Well, sounds like a good idea, but the problem in it is, again, these crazy, everything works in reverse. The harder you push down with prohibition, the worse the drug problem becomes. So this this was back, uh, I think, the, the latest year I can see here. It looks like 2003 on this thing. Yeah, I received in April 2004. What happens? Let's skip this over a few years. Eight years later, 15 tons of meth seized in Mexico. <laughs> February 9, 2012. I was in Indiana to testify on, a, on an item here about a year or so ago, and, and they're talking about, well, you know, Sudafed is uh, used as, a, as one of the ingredients to make uh, meth, so we have to put it behind the counter. Uh, we have, you have to have a, yeah, your mother's note to buy the Sudafed. Well, you can't even do that. And then the guy who's buying the Sudafed at this drugstore might be going to the next drugstore again. So now we need to put in place laws that's going to keep track of who's, who's buying a string of Sudafed from multiple drugstores. And the, and the state police come in with all of their graphs and lamps and stuff and, sh and show all, all of this uh, meth problem everywhere. Well, they're putting in place rules that, 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 that promote it. Methamphetamine is a stimulant. Stimulants aren't good for people generally. But who do we give stimulants to? Jet airplane pilots who are flying sorties over uh, uh, in, in, in the wars in uh, Vietnam and, uh, and the Persian Gulf to keep the guys awake uh, going day after day. That doesn't mean it's recommended, but you know, drugs are either up, down, or sideways. They're, they're either a stimulant that they depress you 
or, or they make it a little funny. Uh, the, the same thing can be said with some of the stuff that we drink. Um, anyway, uh, so the point is that, that, that we end up with more drugs, uh, we end up with more disease, in 1992, it cost $100,000 to keep somebody alive with uh, AIDS. Well, if, why do we care about AIDS and drugs? Because injecting drug users often get high and they end up sharing dirty needles. They can't afford the clean needle. The government won't sponsor uh, government-paid needle exchange programs because we send the wrong message. So we, we end up with $100,000 with just one new guy who gets AIDS sharing a dirty needle with some friend. Uh, an estimate is that uh, one in five HIV diagnoses for women are related to in, in drug injecting. So, jump forward here to 2006, because we've improved the AIDS uh, drugs, we can now keep the people along alive longer. So, so the average life expectancy is 24 years. The cost over the lifetime of the person with AIDS is now 600,000. Uh, well, so, so, you know, there, there's a price tag that comes with that. Who gets the price tag? Who, who pays the bill? The people, the public. If you spend a dollar on, on, on medical for, for AIDS, it's a dollar you can't pay on school. It's a dollar you can't pay on public health. It's a job you can't pay for, for uh, the stimulus of, of, of industries. Um, then we end up with drug war deficits. Across the country, because of this wonderful drug war, and of course a few other things, but, but in large measure the, the drug war, well, we end up with crises of every kind, so that the states can't pay the bills, the counties can't pay the bills, the federal government can't pay the bills. I used to think the war on drugs was going to end back in the, in, the, in, the seven, in the 1990s because of the killings that were so bad, particularly in minority communities, that they're going to be demanding an end to the war on drugs. Instead, they're still marching around out there saying, down with dope, up with hope, down with dope, up with hope. It, 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 it sounds good, but it accomplishes nothing. Father Flager is the one leading the marches at the moment. And I like Father Flager, and I have great respect for Father Flager. But he refuses to address the economics of drug prohibition, which is its heart. You can talk in this world today about treatment and education and prevention and more law enforcement, but what's the, the elephant in the room that you can't talk about? What is it? Prohibition. Prohibition, the economics that takes something that grows on a plant and makes it the most valuable commodity on the face of the earth, that tempts the kids and corrupts the police, that destroys neighborhoods, that puts drugs next to your house and next to my house. And it infuriates me because I see all this extra credit killing. What feeds the gangs? How do they make their living? They sell drugs. Well, are we going to take the profit out of the drug business so these guys can't afford uh, to, to create the havoc so they stop tempting the kids to go into the drug business? So they stop tempting the kid, if you bounce the ball, here's 50 bucks. I'm going to be doing a little business in the car over here. You see, you see a car with an M plate, an unmarked vehicle, I want you to push the button. Or I want to stop, stop bouncing the ball or they'll give them the, uh, the key thing, you know, makes the light walk it down and, and, as a warning. Then you, you, the kids have been corrupted. You've got a good parent, a good church, a good school, and for 50 bucks, that kid has been uh, sidetracked off the straight and narrow. It's that simple. We take a town where they've never had illicit drugs, and I go to that town as a drug dealer, and, and, and I say, I want the kid who, who is the natural athlete, who's, uh, who, who's, 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 who's handsome, who's smart, who's a jack. Uh, who's well-liked, who's the leader of his group. And I go to him and I say, hey, listen, we need uh, an outlet down here. Uh, I've got substances that we need to be distributed. Uh, there's lots of money in this for you. We'll provide the drugs. We'll provide the guns, the gangs. You have to do this surreptitiously. Uh, are you interested? Well, and here, here's, here's a couple thousand to get you started. Overnight, you, you, can, you can take a neighborhood that had no drugs and make it drug -full. The war on drugs is criminogenic criminogenic causes it. it it's drugogenic drugogenic I'm making up new words and, 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 and it's uh, it's, uh, it's corrupting it's 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 corruptogenic criminogenic all right uh, the war on drugs uh, Ross Pro says you can't pay a uh, billion dollars a day what he was he wanted remember what he said you can't run the country a billion dollars a day in the home yeah I, I voted him just because he said that <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> And now it's nothing. I mean, it's piddly. Uh, 
uh, uh, the war so we got trade imbalance. We got our money, cash going out on railroad tracks between Tijuana and, and uh, Mex and, and uh, San Diego, or Tijuana and who's on the other side? <coughs> San Diego, Tijuana. Uh, so here's drug tunnels, uh, 25 tons and 20 tons, uh, a couple days apart. Uh, and, and actually, they, they got air-conditioned, uh, lighted tunnels with railroad cars, and the railroad cars full of cash going one way and, and the drugs coming the other. 60% of the Mexican drug cartel money is marijuana. You think we could legalize marijuana in the United States? Oh, no. God, not that. Right? What medical marijuana, people with MS, people with glaucoma, people with neurological disease, you think we could have the compassion to say, well, at least for people who are sick, they're, they're undergoing radiation and so forth, and they're throwing up and they can't keep their food down and they got AIDS wasting, we're going to let them have some medicine, marijuana, and make them feel better? Oh, no. Do you think in, in, in Cook County we could have pot tickets? Oh, no. I mean, it's pathetic. It's pathetic. We elect these people. Leaders don't lead. Leaders follow. And leaders give the people what they wanted. The United States wanted the war on drugs. They wanted it. They supported the people who voted it. And, and, and we the people got it. Now, we the people have the power to undo the harm which we have done to ourselves. But the politicians are going to be at the end of the parade, not the beginning of the parade. So if you want drug policy reform, you must insist upon it yourself so that we can cure trade imbalance. Stop corrupting the kids. I was at Theta Chi of Michigan State. Here's, here's um, San Diego's uh, DEA drug, uh, dozen uh, kids' uh, brothers are arrested. Six different fraternities for selling crack cocaine. You think the kids in this fraternity were any different than the kids that were in my fraternity in Michigan? We didn't do State. drugs in my fraternity. Hmm? What's that? We never did drugs. Well, which we school? <laughs> We're so old, I don't know if they invented all these drugs. You know, you know they invented the highball during Prohibition. It didn't exist. But the people would go into clubs, the speakeasies, and they would bring the flask, and, and they would order a 7-Up, and then they would, they would take the 7-Up like this, and they would take the flask out, and they would pour it in there. And that was the beginning of the highball. The crack cocaine didn't exist and, and, until we started prohibiting it. The synthetic cannabinoids that they're making now, they're talking about these kids overdosing on, on legal drugs and, and, and consuming poisons. Well, we've outlawed marijuana that'll do them little harm, and now they're putting in place these uh, synthetic things, uh, uh, synthetic cannabis, they're calling it, which isn't really cannabis, uh, and it's killing the kids. I mean, we're doing it to ourselves and to our own kids. So we corrupt the kids. Here, here's the Ivy League schools doing the same thing, you know. Corruption. Uh, and informants, uh, paid, cops, corrupted, society run. Uh, the, the, the cop and the drug dealer are partners. I mean, here's 15 cops are busted in FBI sting. Here's, here's one of our chief proponents in Chicago, a guy getting all the acclimates for the good things that he's doing. The thing that he's not doing is calling for an end to the war on drugs. It's corrupting all of these people. We've got a sheriff who's doing a better job than the sheriff we used to have, in my, my judgment. But we still have all this uh, corruption in drugs. Uh, we, we've got prison guards. We had a prison guard in Cook County who took in a pack of uh, cigarettes that had some marijuana laced in with the cigarettes. He's a correctional officer. He shouldn't do that. What do you do with somebody who violates their their, their duty and their oath? What do you do? You fire him. What did we do with him? Well, we fired him, but what else did we do? We sentenced this guy, a judge sentenced him to seven years in prison. It costs us over $30,000 a year. It will cost us taxpayers $250,000, roughly, to lock up this prison guard because he took some marijuana in. Why? Because he could make some money. You know, you fired the guy. You don't penalize society. You don't take money away from kids who need school grants. Illinois is 50th in the funding of public education because we spend money building prisons. During the 1990s, we built a new penitentiary in Illinois every year. We have 50,000 people locked up behind bars. California has 170,000 people locked up behind, behind bars. So many that the, the, the living conditions are so deplorable that the United States Supreme Court has said you're going to release 30,000 of them from California. 
we can't pay the bills. Tony Preckwinkle doesn't want to just let drug dealers out or be soft on drugs or soft on crime, but she's looking at the bills and she says, I can't pay the bills. I've said I'm going to get rid of a sales tax or part of the penny sales tax. Uh, you know, it's popular, she wants to do that. But how am I going to pay the bills? 90% of the, uh, or is it 90 or 80% of the, uh, of, the, of the Cook County budget is, is for health care and, and, and for the prisons. The Cook County Hospital, the Cook County Jail, the Justice Department. She can't pay the bills. So she's saying, well, let's, let's get rid of the pot anyway. Quit ruining the lives of these 23,000 kids. We've got the mayor, a new mayor, sitting on his hands like the old mayor standing on his hands. We have more corruption. Here's a cop who's delivering in uniform, a sergeant who's delivering uh, marijuana in a squad car. On duty, in a marked squad. We should send him to there, right? All sergeants should go to there. Uh, we're, we're feeding the gangs. The, the number now is estimated sometimes at 100,000 gang members in Chicago. Now, as our new superintendent McCarthy says, Chicago has this unique problem. We've got gangs coming out of our ears. We've got them everywhere. It's worse than L.A. Well, I think it is. I think it is. United Chicago's right in the center of the country. It's a perfect distribution place for drugs. I mean, if, if you want to be centrally located, you've got transportation, air, rail, uh, you've got interstate highway systems, you can have drugs everywhere. How am I going on time? Tim? Um, you got until about uh, 20 after 9, depending on how much more material you got. Okay. You want to have plenty of time for questions, so right. take, your, take, take, take what time you need. Uh, uh, we got drug war guns. Uh, you, you recognize the Al Capone days. They used to hang off the side of Packers and they'd shoot up the places they'd drive by. Well, now they hang off of SUVs and they got AK-47s, but it's the same thing. Different substances, different prohibition. But again, prohibition, the heart of what's wrong. Uh, we, we've got uh, drug war violence. Uh, th these are old stories. You know, just Rahm Emanuel uh, here, he said just a week or so ago, he said, I'm so sick of the violence. What are we going to do about it? Well, we're going to have a redeployment of the, of the gang thing. Uh, we're going to have uh, you know, these computers. Uh, we're we're, we're going to eliminate the gang task force special things. And we're going to put the guys back into the street. We're going to increase the number of officers on the street. Those things are good. But, but what is feeding these gangs internally? The former U.S. attorney in Chicago said, well, I cut the head off the gangster disciples. Larry Hoover and all of his crew is in prison. What difference has it made? None. None. Why? Because prohibition is like turning the faucets on in the bathtub with crises of every sort spewing out. And they just keep coming. And you can bail and you can do but it keeps causing the problems. It's prohibition and it's problems that are spewing out of the knob. Instead of turning off the knobs by ending prohibition and ending the war on drugs, no, no, we just keep on doing the same thing. Anyway, um, the violence in Chicago is just epidemic. It's what brought me back. I, I practiced law. I represented cities, villages, townships, libraries. Uh, and I had been away from the drug law for a long time and the criminal prosecution, and I came back to it because I'm, I'm sitting there, and, and one weekend they killed some 12 kids back in, uh, it was 1992. And then I would listen to the politicians give their speech, and they said, you know, uh, we're going to get tough, we're going to crack down, show them the business. And, 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 and they all said the same thing. And I said, that's what we've been doing. We've got the three-time loser laws. We've built prisons like they're going out of style. What one in every 100 Americans is behind bars. We have the highest rate of incarceration of any country in the world. The land of the free is now the home of the prisons. It's the rate of loyal to 100 people, too. Pardon? A loyal to 100 people, too. We have a loyal to 100 people in the U.S. Yeah, 2.3 million people are behind bars. Uh, for our, you know, crazy prison we need Bible. Okay, so uh, then we end up with drug war schools. Here's a, down here it says about 28% of, of all students were offered, sold, or given illegal drugs by someone on school property during the last year. This was a survey done of uh, suburban Cook County kids. I already said in the high school, by me, they got heroin problems. 
that kids who came home from prom at 10.30 because the, the big party was going to be marijuana. Didn't want, kids didn't want to go. So they're home at 10.30 on that uh, prom at uh, what do you call home prom. Uh, that's just a nice cartoon, drug control from Mexico, more drug violence, uh, 54 shot. This, this was last summer. You know, Mayor, Mayor Daly was so frustrated because he tried, he wanted so badly to stop the violence that he put all these different ideas in place. And he, he's a friend of mine. He and I were at CONCON together. And I would write him and I'd say, you know, no one can stop the violence without ending drug prohibition. We need to take the profit out of drugs to take crime off our streets and taxes off our backs. And it's just it was too much to ask of, of, of him. And so far, it's been too much to ask of Rob. There's still time. <coughs> Uh, we end up with a worldwide uh, drug, drug war violence. Here, uh, this was in, in Mexico. Uh, it, it was 23,000 and a little over what's that, a year and a half. Now it's, now it's over 50,000. Over 50,000 people have been killed since Philip Calderon took office in, in December of 2006. There's a new election in July. I, when I was down in Latin America, Latin America is about to erupt because the people are so fed up with the killing and the corruption, that it's not safe. As in Chicago, in many places, it's not safe. Now, I live in a place where, I mean, I'm more likely to get stepped on a reindeer than shot. Uh, but, but many people don't live in, in that. And, and in a town, you smile, in the town, one town over from me, Payless Heights, uh, Southwest Cook County, they just put up a new $4 million police department. They have no crime. But they, and, and how much did it cost the taxpayers? Nothing. They, they used forfeited drug money in order to put up this Taj Mahal Police Department. It, it, it didn't cost the taxpayers anything. There's no bonded indebtedness. So, so is the mayor uh, in favor of the war on drugs? Are the aldermen? Well, yeah, look at this. Taj Mahal didn't cost you a penny. Well, the problem is that that city is a drug war gravy train ride. You know, they're benefiting by supporting the same things that the cartels and the drug dealers want, i.e. prohibition. Uh, drug war prison, we well, already talked about it. Uh, 900,000 marijuana arrests a year in the United States. In New York, they stop and frisk people. They said, uh, you know, you look suspicious to me, empty your pockets. Well, it's not a violation, a violation if you've got uh, drugs in your pocket, but it's a violation if the marijuana is out. So you empty your pockets and all the marijuana, and now I arrest you for the marijuana. And, and, and now that person's got a record, a criminal record, he can't go to school, that whole list of things. We take away their right to vote. Talk about controlling of, 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 a, of a civilization that was slavery, but, but by, by taking away their right to vote. Their, their right to earn a living, their right to get a job. You are a revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried, I so got so frustrated, you know, I knew we weren't paying for schools, and so I put up a sign that said, schools, not jails, and the drug war. This was in the village of Worth. The mayor and his crew ripped the sign out of the ground about three weeks after it was there because it was generating so much publicity. I applied for a, a sign for a minute. I paid 350 bucks or whatever for the sign. <laughs> they ripped it out of the ground. Hey, they said, this gives our town a bad reputation. <laughs> and not too many people call. <laughs> anyway, I had a nice big yellow school bus uh, park. I invited like 75 school districts to come to the dedication of the sign that's going to say, support schools, not prisons. You would think they would come. But the, 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 the educators that go to Springfield and they say, we need more money, but they don't say, you know, take less money for prisons, give some of that to us. The pie is only so big. When you make the pie bigger for prisons, it's smaller for schools, or it's smaller for health care, or it's smaller for something that matters. We have drug war racial disparity. In Cook County, if you're African American, you're 58 times more likely to go to, go to prison uh, than, than if you do the same crime as a white guy. Something's wrong with that. Uh, eight to one racial disparity in a more recent uh, uh, survey that was done. The Illinois uh, uh, Disproportionate Justice Impact Commission came to the same conclusion, uh, uh, which, which is just in, in undeniable. Here's a guy who makes Tupperware submarines at a million dollars a count. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you guys know the kudos? <laughs> <laughs> the question, why is the war on drugs raged so long, failed so mightily, 
And, and, and uh, it caused so much harm, and uh, why, why do we keep doing it? Uh, the answer is the drug war gravy train. The good guys and the bad guys are in favor of it. Who's against it? It's like lining up on, uh, on the football field with nobody on the other side. Everybody's on one side. Don't we need some intelligent people to get over there on the other side? The bad guys and the good guys are both on the same side of the drug war line of scrimmage, both in favor of the crazy drug war. Who's against the drug war? We are, right? There's much more we tried. Here, here was a parade. I tried uh, the, the mm -hmm. but go look at the parade to see if I could get people interested. <laughs> uh, made a little noise. Uh, Charlie, is that done? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much done. See, see marijuana for healing. That's good. Thank All right. What uh, what's your favorite blend? Sensimilia, Hawaiian, or Jamaican? <laughs> my, my favorite. I'm drink. kidding. <laughs> Anyone with a real question, raise your hand, please. Okay, Ross. Question. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, if people listen to all these statistics, um, I mean, they're kind of overwhelming. You'd say now, if you legalize it, every place they've legalized it, it made it even worse. So the question I'm going to get at is how we look at it. And you've all seen the movies, The Keystone Cops, right? And the problem with The Keystone Cops is to look at every little thing at the bottom that can fill up your world with statistics, and it's actually run for Question. All right? Now, you look at this as an opium war. We have Landsat satellites in the United States. Question. Let me get to a question. Well, why do we think about it? Leave it for the rebuttal. Question. Do we have the Landsat satellite capability to spot all these plants, crops specific to, to them to wipe them out? Do we have the detection capability to monitor heroin and, and confiscate it in, block, in bulk? Do we not have an army in Afghanistan, standing in the drug fields where 92% of the heroin is processed and the refineries are right there, could we not have an alliance that burns those fields, busts the, uh, the refineries, and walks out with the Russians and the Iranians and the United States putting real crops in it? Could we not actually take it from the top down and bust those banks that belong to the drug money that are taking the bailouts and running all these budget cut operations in the cities and everybody's playing games of drama. So the question is, don't we have, as thinking human beings, which is why we should destroy these drugs, so we have our kids who are thinking human beings, break it from the top down, just as an added factor, the Queen's Bank, the Queen's Bank, Coots Bank, just got busted for 8.7 million pounds of drug money laundering. Yeah. So, nice start. The uh, suggestion made by the question is that uh, we have satellite capabilities so we can eliminate these drugs and find them and destroy them because drugs are bad. The difficulty is that in Afghanistan, uh, basically their entire economy is heroin, the opium plant. We have outlawed Since opium. We have outlawed opium for the past 100 years, and we have more opium than we ever had. Stronger drugs than we've ever had. But who's in charge there? Many answer, but yeah, we we have. Uh, in Afghanistan, an army of United States soldiers, and we are unable to eliminate it. If we could eliminate all of the drugs in Afghanistan, they would pop up somewhere else. It's called the balloon theory. When you squeeze it here, it pops up here. So now they go to the Golden Triangle. You can plant drugs in Central America. In Mexico, they're now planting the drugs. You cannot eliminate drugs because God put them here. He put, he put dandelions here, and, and we go out every spring and we buy Scott's fertilizer and we weed killer to try to get rid of the dandelions. And, and, and Scott's can't get rid of the dandelions, and the world is not going to get rid of the other plants that were created by Mother Nature. They do a pretty good job on most lawns. Pardon? They do a pretty good job on most lawns if you're dedicated to doing it. Rom, oh, come on. Yeah, we, we are destroying, right now we're trying to... We're, we're trying an eradication program 
in, in various parts of the country, the United Nations is supporting it. And the difficulty is that, that the people who are asked to put in some kind of a crop substitution plan so that they've got some kind of income are taking the money and still growing the, 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 the drugs. They're, they're destroying the uh, Amazon forest because they contaminate. We go in and spray the land, so now it's contaminated, so they can't grow uh, livestock, they can't grow plants. So they don't go back to that same land. They clear new stuff. We're destroying our forest. So take the second part of that. What about the conversation? Machine guns, AK 47s, being, being sold into Mexico. And the idea was that we're not going to arrest or stop the guns because we want to find out who it is that's delivering the drugs. So, so we let all of these guns go into Mexico uh, in order to try to solve the drug problem. And, and of course, some of those guns ended up being used to kill the, uh, the uh, U.S. agent, which is why it's gotten so much attention. But the people in Mexico, when I was down there, are absolutely furious with us. It's, it's like the, uh, the, 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 the contra business all over again, where our own agencies are corrupted and, and, and uh, are doing horrible things in the name of this ridiculous war on drugs, which is absolutely unwinnable as evidence by the last hundred years of opiates. Yes. In your opinion, when you have time. who's making more money, the drug dealers or the incarceration industry with its courts and police expenditures? <coughs> well, the, the war on drugs has now spent over a trillion dollars. Uh, and, and because this drug economy is underground, it makes it hard to count. It's like the guy who's in the cash business. Uh, you don't really know how much the restaurant door was. <laughs> you, you just don't know how much uh, they're making because it's, it's suppressed. But uh, it's safe to say that humongous amounts of money are being made on both sides. So the bad guys are in favor of the drug war and the good guys are in favor of the drug war. And that, to me, makes absolutely no sense. Yes. There's a number that I've wondered about for a long time, and I have never seen a, a serious estimate. If you add up all the cops making drug busts, and all the jails, and all the courts, and judges, and the lawyers on both sides, and the prisons, and the whole prison industrial complex, how many jobs is the war on drugs? Well, the question is, how many uh, jobs are there involved in this war on drugs? On the good guy's side, uh, we end up putting in place drug courts. So we have to hire more judges, more prosecutors, more public defenders. We have pretrial services people. We hire more probation officers, parole officers. We hire prison contractors, prison subcontractors. The guy who's got the contract for the sundries, for the clothes, for the transportation of the prisoners. Uh, we ended up uh, hiring people for uh, the drug testing concession. We've got laboratories that get drug testing work. We end up with uh, the scholarly people who are writing papers at the United Nations where it's one study after another study about what should be done. Uh, we end up with uh, cities and villages by forfeiting money. We end up with, with law enforcement or bounty where, where uh, the mayors and trustees are able to pay policemen's salary, the overtime, the guns, the squad cars, the police budget, so that, that, that every time you see a policeman, every time you see a deer sticker on a Cook County uh, squad car, these are all programs that are is funneling money. If you own newspapers and radio and television and are pumping hundreds of millions of dollars a year into anti-drug ads, that's hundreds of millions of dollars going to radio, TV, billboard companies. So. There's so many different ways that money is, is being made. Uh, the entire prison industrial complex, the, uh, the, the, the south rate of crimes on rape and murder and armed robbery and burglary has plummeted while, while the drug arrests 
continue to go up. If, if, if we're a police department here and we're going to decide what crimes are we going to go out and work on today, if we can solve <coughs> drug crimes and seize the, the drugs and the money, we want to wait until the transactions happen so the money is there, now we get to forfeit the money, half of it goes to the local law enforcement and basically half goes to the feds. So we will now have more money to hire more of us, more prison guards, more police officers, uh, higher wages, bigger cars, better guns, and we've got speed boats, we've got airplanes, we've got everything, because we are the silent uh, drug war beneficiary. Neil, have you added that all up? I've, I've tried, and, and the, my best estimate is it comes somewhere close to a million jobs. Um, do you know of, 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 any, of, of anywhere that somebody has actually tried to figure out how many people are on the payroll when you go all the way across? Uh, I, I know that there are people that try to do cost-benefit analysis, uh, but it, it, is, it is really very difficult. Uh, in, a, in a million jobs in the United States with, what, 330 million, I would say that that is very, very conservative. Uh, that's a good question. All right, David, then Charles. My question is, how many high-level government officials? High-level? High level? My, que yeah, go ahead. My question is, how many high level government officials uh, are making fortunes from drugs? Uh, when I was in Mexico City, a woman came up to me and said, first question asked after I'd spoken, she said, who's making all the money in the United States? What, what government agency is it? <laughs> and uh, she was very serious. You know, but I really think it's more systemic than that. It isn't, uh, in some countries, somebody that the Mexican drug star is behind bars. The guy who's in charge of the evidence ball in Chicago is behind bars. The guy who's the head of gang crimes in Chicago is behind bars. Uh, so there's many, many people who are being corrupted. But, but that is such a small part compared to all of these jobs that we're talking about. Clinton says we had so much crime in this country, we need to hire 100,000 police officers. Well, why do we have so much crime? Well, because the drug war causes crime. It causes two kinds of unnecessary crime. One is addict crime, and the other is turf war crime. Kids fighting over who's going to make the money in the drug business, and the, and the addict who can't afford to pay the drug bill, and was hitting his neighbor over the head, breaking into somebody's house, steal the TV, turning to prostitution. And, and, and so that's where the really uh, big money is, it is in the drug war. My Good understanding thing. is that uh, my understanding is that the Roosevelt family made their fortunes from the opium trade. Uh, I uh, 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 <laughs> Charles smuggles gold. Yeah, now so James, there's a. Uh, don't you think there's a bit of a fallacy of approaching legislation from this quantitative approach of yours? Uh, we don't look, dear lawyer, you look upon laws as just mathematical calculations that you gave us multiple things. What's the cost of a drug addicted person? I don't know if you can put a figure on that. I mean, I'm a little worrisome about this kind of, you know, this is kind of Republican kind of way of looking at running society. And Democrats are a little more humanistic. Yeah. Hey, that guy went on for 20 minutes. You didn't say anything, Gene. Uh, well, I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, no, your the law is not this. What's good? The laws have are good laws. Are they good for society? Well, let, let me say this. Are they uh, are they beneficial to the people? And I don't think this calculation is the basis of it. That's well. My the, part question, of life. the question is: Is drug policy good for the people? And would drug legalization be good for the people? The, the, the answer to that is that we have had the drug war in this country for 40 years. We have changed the land of the free into the home of the prisoners. We have more people dying of overdoses 
more kids overdosing, more kids using drugs. The Global Commission on Drugs that just finished a, uh, a report this past summer that was signed by the former presidents of, of Switzerland, the former presidents of Colombia, uh, by uh, Volcker, former head of the Federal Reserve System in this country, by Kofi Annan, by uh, the leaders of many countries around the world who called for an end to the war on drugs and for a new drug policy. And, and they did it because over the last 10 years, last 10 years worldwide, opium use is up 34%. Cocaine use is up 27%. Marijuana use is up over 8%. The war on drugs doesn't work. It makes society drugogenic. So, so what is the cost of that? All of those things come with prices for addicts, for families that, that, uh, that aren't working, that don't have money to pay the bills, that can't take care of their kids. And yet, yet on the opposite side of the equation, if you go to countries where they decriminalize drugs the last uh, 10 years, in, in Portugal since 2000, drug use went down, it didn't go up. Drug addiction went down, it didn't go up. So countries have accomplished what we're trying to accomplish by doing the opposite of what we're doing. In Switzerland, a heroin addict can come to the doctor and get a daily injection for six bucks. You can't afford the heroin injection, it's for free. So what happens now that the person is not spending every waking minute trying to figure out how am I going to get the money for the next fix? The answer is that in, based on that Switzerland experiment, that they're able to take care of their families, they're able to hold down jobs, that they're, they're, many of them are quitting using drugs of their own volition, the countries where they put in place uh, more tolerant uh, laws concerning marijuana, they, they have ended up with fewer people using marijuana than we have in the United States. Fewer people that are going to harder drugs. So that everything, again, the drug war rule that I tried to convince you of earlier, is everything with drug war work works in reverse. Okay, John. John, uh, Doug, uh, there are some who say that the drug problem has not been with us 40 years, rather 50 years, and it began with the CIA and the uh, Southeast Direct and the Triangle back in the early 1960s. I'm and sorry, I can't now. hear you. Uh, maybe it's my hearing, but, but I want everybody to hear your question. Should I get him the mic? That the problem, the drug problem, began in the early 1960s, over in Southeast Asia, and the initiator of that was the CIA and the yeah. What do you say to that? The CIA. Yeah. Well, the, the, the question is, uh, has the CIA, CIA been involved in, in making the drug problem worse? It's more than that. Did they initiate it? Did they, they initiate it? Yes. I mean, the early 60s. I mean, drugs have been here forever, and people have used drugs I mean, America's forever. problem. America's problem. Let's talk about America's problem. We're not okay, well, problem. And, 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 and America, and, and the, uh, Nixon declared the war on drugs in 1971, June 17th. And at the time that he did so, we really didn't have a big drug problem. We had some soldiers who went to, to Vietnam and that had access to uh, drugs that they didn't have in the United States. And so when they found that out, they said, well, we're going to have guys, when they come back, uh, we're going to have them stop at a base and make sure they're clean before we let them loose in society. And when they got out of the environment of, of Vietnam and the dangers and so forth that were involved, that drug use basically stopped. There was no big epi epi epidemic. I worked in drug courts in Chicago in the early 70s. And, and I had a judge in drug courts say, uh, Jim, look around. He says, I know everybody in the room. There are only two kinds of people here. There's the narcs and, and the addicts. And, and, and uh, he, he said, you know, I hear the case, and uh, one, one says, you know, I was minding my own business, the cops come up, he said, I dropped that, I didn't drop that. And, 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 the, and the officer says, well, I see these two guys lurking in the doorway, and uh, when I approached, uh, they, they dropped the stuff. The, the thing that was interesting about what the judge told me was that he knows everybody in the room. He says, there aren't new people coming in. These are the same, same people. Sometimes I let a few go, and sometimes I put them in jail for a few days but it's a closed set. What changed that was when we started declaring the war on drugs. The worse you push down, 
the worse the problem becomes. The more advertisements you run, the worse the problem becomes. The more you increase the, the price by suppressing it, the more is supplied and the more drugs are available. Okay. So, so next, initiated of Walter and then Barbara. I have two questions. All right. Before I ask the question, you want to know who's making the money on drugs? Read the book Freakonomics. That pretty much covers it. <coughs> Uh, first question is, well, I, I'm all in favor of uh, legalizing marijuana. <coughs> I just love the 21st Amendment. I love my purple. So uh, I'm all, all for that. But the question I have for you is the next level, cocaine, which we really have to eliminate because it really ruins a lot of lives. And if like, I get what you're saying about the marijuana, if, if it is in a pretty general use, they'll be less inclined to go to uh, heavier stuff. Bucket. But they're going to go there anyway. Do you have any any solutions for nabbing the ones who hook the kids right. or adults in the first place? That's my first question. Right. Okay. Uh, the first question is, uh, you know, with okay. drugs like cocaine, which uh, certainly pose right. risk, uh, do, do we... Uh, uh, do we have some way of, of, of controlling? What should we do? Well, uh, and, and you worry that if we legalize it, it'll be more available and more problems. And my question to you is, if we legalize cocaine, are you going to use it? What? If we legalize cocaine, are you going to use it? I haven't used any kind of drug ever. I've okay. seen too many go down the drain. Right. I used to hang, like he was talking about the CIA. So the answer, I hung answer. around 63rd Street when I was a teenager, and there was plenty of drugs back in those days. But the, the, point, the point is that I'm trying to make is that, that I asked you if you're going to use cocaine <laughs> if we legalize it, you say no. And, and I think that is true of most people. I don't think people, whether you legalize them or not, are going to change what they're going to do anyway. Yeah, but what I'm asking you is, how do you stop the ones who hook the children or the adults in the first place? But I'll go on to my second question, uh, oh. which is, uh, is it average, above average, or below average, the addiction rate in countries where they execute them, drug dealers? What happens? There are some countries like that. Okay, in, in, in Saudi Arabia, they, they would cut the person's hand off uh, for using drugs. And I was running for state's attorney of Cook County in 1992, and, and I was at an IBI function and was asked that question from the audience, well, why don't we do like Saudi Arabia and, and cut their hands off? And I, I said then, uh, it's a good idea. The problem is what do you do with all the hands? They had the death penalty for using uh, heroin uh, in China. In, in the Yunnan province in southeast uh, uh, China, they have over one million addicts in just the one province. The point being that the severity of the penalty does not prevent uh, someone from doing what they're going to do. No, thank the British for that. Right. Deterrence doesn't work. Uh, Bernie, and then Bob Matter, and then Jeff. And okay, without wanting to give Rahm Emanuel any ideas, in an effort to decriminalize this, do you think that red light or speed cameras could be adapted for $100 enforcements? Yes. Uh, uh, you, you, you tie the, uh, the uh, red lights in with the... Uh, well, in an effort to decriminalize it, yeah, you know, get these cases out of court, you get... Use these the marijuana to, tickets, can you use the red light to issue the Mar Tony Preckwinkle's marijuana tickets? Without wanting to get run I, 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 don't, I don't understand that. I mean, if somebody comes to a red light, you're going to give them a, a marijuana no, ticket. <laughs> Catch them on, on those cameras. Surveillance cameras. Okay, well, you know, again, when you catch them, what are you going to do with them? You'll give them a ticket. Okay, give them a ticket. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the police are already stopping people all the time. We don't need another way to catch them. I'm more worried about the, 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 the big brother public eye uh, watching everything that we, we, we do than I am about uh, catching somebody. I don't care if they smoke marijuana. If, if I don't subscribe to, to using drugs, including marijuana, which I have never used, 
but I think it's criminal that we have people who are sick that can't get medical marijuana. I think it would be a better policy in this world if every man, woman, and child over the age of 16 was required to have a marijuana plant. And if you allowed your marijuana plant to die and didn't replace it within a week, you would be fine. Now everyone's got a marijuana plant. I don't want to buy from you. You don't want to buy from me. He doesn't want to buy from him. And everybody would be upset the fact that they got to take care of this lousy plant so they don't get fined. It, it would eliminate overnight the problem with marijuana. Why would that eliminate it? Um, it's not going to eliminate marijuana, but nobody's going to care about it. Nobody's going to going to going to do it. Uh, certainly not buy it. Certainly not trade it. Certainly not twenty one thousand tons coming from from uh, Mexico. Okay, Bob Matter. <laughs> yeah, in uh, two thousand and ten, uh, we uh, lost their booth at the uh, at the mental health mental health uh, uh, conference, and I was wondering if. Uh, do you, have you subsequently gone back and have they allowed you to have a booth? Have you made any more uh, a booth at uh, oh. at the uh, at Sam show? S A M H S A. Uh, it's this. It's uh, oh, what's it called? Here? The Center for Abuse or what? Uh, well, the, the the question is about mental health and. Uh, and, There's and, and a conference. No, he said that you yeah, the substance abuse and uh, mental health services administration. Who's who is who's you the that's LEA, lost the boot? Lee, Lee, the organization. Oh, they well, you know. And then they were, and then oh, they were I, I, you're speaking of. We were invited to to be uh, guests at a conference in Chicago that was going to be. Uh, dealing with women's rights, and and there was a conference, and it was uh, sponsored by uh, a, a national organization as well as LEAP, uh, or not LEAP, uh, uh, TASC, Treatment Alternatives to Street Crime, in in uh, in Chicago, and and we were initially uh, invited and authorized to have a uh, table, uh, and and then they kicked us out because they thought that. That someone, some organization, even if it was police officers who used to fight the war on drugs, that they're calling for legalizing drugs, that that was inimical with with the interests of uh, health care providers who wanted to, to see people saved from drugs. Uh, so so we were ousted from that, that that table and were not permitted to to uh, uh, participate. I do not think that was a shining moment for. Uh, either the federal agency or the local Chicago. Uh, okay, so you're, you're banned forever from that. Well, I mean, every every year, you know, you get new leaders, and and, and, and sometimes people wake up. Uh, I, I I hope every day when I wake up. Right, the so world. Just ask a follow up question: Have you had tables at other events like county fairs and things like that? We go everywhere. I have I have given speeches to grade schoolers that are calling for the legalization of drugs uh, in in one. And it's, it's called the best Northfield, the best uh, uh, highest rated uh, grade school in, in the country. I I have uh, been before college groups, uh, TVs. I, I've I've debated uh, the the Illinois Supreme Court Justice Fitzgerald, the uh, uh, people from the drug czar's office. Uh, it, it's 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 just it's so evident everywhere that the war on drugs doesn't work. It, it's so evident that we have to do something else if we're going to regain the control of our neighborhoods, and our kids, and restore moral fabric to our country. Okay. Rose and then Jeff. I'm, my question is: drug use already legalized in certain places at certain times. I went to one of these black concerts. And there were thousands of people there, and they all met up at the same time, and it was a ritual, and which is a regular ritual, where all these lights go on at the same time, and it's supposed to be sort of starry light, you know. Yeah. Where were you? This was in Chicago, at, at one of these big concerts. <laughs> okay, so effectively, uh, the, qu the question is, uh, how do we really legalize drugs anyway? Because when you go to these rock concerts, uh, and the music starts, and the lights go down uh, all, all at once, these these uh, things get lit up. Well, I mean, not only that, when we have these police officers seize all this marijuana in the Cook County Forest Preserves, uh, you drive down 294, everybody's got the window rolled down, taken up with uh, well, uh, crazy. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. uh, my name is Li Ping. Yeah. I just wonder uh, if you look at other countries, uh, they also have a, a, a tough laws uh, like war on drugs, uh, like our country. Uh, the, then the, the real drug, drug problem is uh, they have the same drug problem as in the United States, or United States is uh, even worse. Well, it, 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 it's hard to, to weigh one country against another. Uh, some countries we can do that because the ones who basically been more tolerant on marijuana uh, have had less hard drug use problems consistently in every single instance. Uh, the countries uh, where people are being executed for very small quantities of drugs, uh, you know, the, the people are more careful not to get caught, but because drug use is, is always underground, when you prohibit it, you force the activity underground. Uh, which is what makes it so dangerous, and, but also makes it difficult to evaluate how bad the problem is. In the United States, we have the annual household survey on drug use, where we ask the kids are using drugs, when they use it, so forth. Well, first, you don't know if they're telling the truth. Uh, you don't know whether they're making it sound worse than it is or better than it is. But we can see things in this country. I know that I get a phone call that says we've had a soft lockdown at such and such a high school uh, because we want to keep uh, this uh, safe environment for our children. Uh, so I know they're drug dogs. I know the kids are being locked up. I know the metal detectors in front of the schools. I know their kids are getting shot. I know the gangs continually are regenerating themselves so it doesn't matter how many we lock up and put in prison. I, I know that if, if you own the corner, that it's so valuable that you, you've got to have a gun to protect yourself from the guy who's going to try and take the corner or take your money or take the drugs. And I, I know we end up with shootings. I know we end up with panic uh, I know we fill the prisons. I know we can't pay for schools. I know that we've got a health care epidemic. So how much evidence do we need before we say, we have to try something else in this country and the other ones? Jeff Schrenick and then Dave Zucker. Yes, sir, you've talked about how the good guys, almost as much as the bad guys, are in favor of the war on drugs. And you've talked about how it seems increasingly they keep on graduating up to ever more draconian solutions. Despite that, these draconian solutions seem to do a worse job than the prior, less draconian solution. Um, can you imagine that at least subconsciously in the case of some of these so-called good guys, where this is going would be in the direction of a totalitarian state. In other words, isn't that or isn't that sort of the next argument to be trotted out? Oh gee, this didn't work, so we've got to go to the next level. How many levels are there before we get to an outright totalitarian state and everything but name? The, the question is whether we're really becoming a totalitarian state and a totalitarian world because of this wonderful war on drugs. And I would have to submit that I feel that we are. When uh, I, I see these big brother cameras going uh, out, out into the street, I know we have 3,000 of them or more in Chicago, which is one, one of the most heavily camered places in, in the world. Uh, we, we go, I, when I went to the United Nations, I expected because there was such an eruption of feeling in Mexico where we had six leaders calling for the legalization of drugs or at least the discussion of legalization of drugs in Latin American countries. When I went to the United Nations like three weeks later, I thought, you know, these Latin American countries are going to be there saying, let's, let's end this drug war. It's, it's killing our people. It's corrupting our people. It's, it's making life unlivable. And, and the people who who published the pamphlets and brochures at the United Nations said things like, we need to speak with a unified voice. We need to, they, they would have all this little rhyme words where they didn't want to send. I thought that there would be somebody proposing things, saying, well, let's try this or let's try that. I expected to see debate about drug policy of the world. It was about to be renewed according to the U.S. resolution. 
There was not one vote at the United Nations. There was not one debate or suggestion about a change in prohibition policy. And there was the discouragement of anyone saying anything to rock the boat because it was important that we speak with a unified voice. It's already the people, I went with a judge from Brazil, uh, I went uh, with a, a leap speaker uh, who was the head of a prison in New Hampshire, a uh, United Kingdom undercover uh, intelligence officer, and myself a former prosecutor, all of us from Leap. And we sat there the first couple of days making observations about what we saw. We couldn't believe what was before our eyes. There was no debate. The elephant in the room, the prohibition, was not even mentioned. There was not a single vote. I thought, you know, the United Nations, you know, they talk about stuff, they vote stuff up or down, maybe they disagree, Good. but not a single vote. I asked somebody who was there in previous years, they said, don't they vote? They don't vote, we do it by consensus. Somebody says, I think we should amend this resolution. They move ands and buts around. They, they put commas here, or take commas out, but they don't do anything that touches the subject of drug prohibition. The biggest applause that anyone got was when the president of Bolivia came in, because Bolivia, they, they live in the, the people there live in the Andes, and they historically and culturally, and as part of the, 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 the sacred uh, history of the country, they chew the cocoa leaf. They need it because the cocoa leaf is a stimulant. And, and, and now, when they sign the, the treaty, the 1961 first worldwide prohibition treaty, it outlawed the cocoa leaf. So the president of Bolivia came in and said, we asked a year ago for an exemption for the coca leaf to be legal in our country because it's part of their history, et cetera, et cetera, and it, we were denied. So we, Bolivia, have withdrawn from the United Nations Treaty, withdrew, a little puny country that's going to withdraw and incur the wrath of the United States and the world. So when this speaker came in, uh, he said this was a mistake historically that was made. And our country was a dictatorship at the time, and the people didn't approve this. And our people want the cocoa leaf, need the cocoa leaf, and the cocoa leaf is not cocaine. We're against cocaine, but we're for the cocoa leaf. He says, uh, so he spends, so he said, and we spend $20 million a year. We're a poor country, but we spend $20 million to fight the war on drugs. We're in favor of the war on drugs. We're with you. We just want an exemption for the cocoa leaf. And we use the cocoa leaf, and then he starts pulling out, this is the leaf. Yeah, I'm told that he's got the cocoa leaf. This is the cocoa leaf. And he said, we make tea. And he pulls out of his bed, he's got a box of tea. So I had a stomach ache. My doctor says, have you got cocoa uh, tea? It, 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 and so he goes, he pulls out one product. Here's a, here's a, a liqueur that uh, was manufactured in Austria. Uh, where we were, and which, which she says it has coca in it. Coca Cola used to have coca in it. Uh, so, any, anyway, Bolivia, I, I applauded myself because they're the first ones to withdraw from these god awful treaties that are the prohibition fountain of the world. And they supported the war on drugs in all these other respects, which I disagree with, but. But they at least did something that no one else previously had the courage to do. All right, David. Uh, Charles had a uh, second question, and Karina, who's not had a question. All right. You used a very interesting analogy a little while ago concerning a mandate uh, concerning the mar a marijuana plant. Now, if Congress did something like that. And we did all have marijuana plants. At what point would it wind up before the Supreme Court, like the current mandate in, the, in Barack Obama's health plan? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought of the same thing. I said, if we can't, if we can't mandate somebody to get insurance, I wonder if we can mandate somebody to grow a plant. I thought, I thought of that. Uh, it's a curious observation which you made. I used to worry, and when I was running for state's attorney in 1992, and not enough of you voted for me. But I wanted to take the profit out of drugs, take crime off our streets and taxes off our backs, which I'm still trying to do. I ran for governor in 1994 on the same idea. Not enough of you voted for me in the Democratic primary. So, so I, I didn't get to become uh, Illinois' first drug policy reform uh, governor. Um, but, but the same things that I was talking about back then are the same things that need to be done now. 
And it doesn't matter who you elect or who you're for, who you're against, or what policy we put in place. Without drug policy reform, none of these crises will be ameliorated any significant degree. All right. Mm -hmm. This gentleman over here is. Uh, um, well, this guy over here is. Well, well, I know, late. but the. He's Karina. Karina. You were a you were a prosecutor. You were fighting the war on drugs. Now you're not. You're against the war on drugs. Was there a particular case? Was there an aha moment? Was there a particular person or another? What happened? It was the 12 kids that were killed in one weekend. Uh, as I say, 1999, 1992, 1991, 92, and then everybody was saying the same thing. And, and so for I realized when I was running for office, I was saying something that was very unpopular. You don't go in front of a group of people and say, you know, we need to get soft on drugs and soft on crime to make things better. <laughs> uh, but um, it, it, it's drug policy which is the, the, the heart of what's wrong. And it's drug policy we must change. But, but it was just one case in 1992 of 12 kids dying. Yeah, I mean, that was the principal thing. But I mean, I have so many different stories. I mean, we had killings and shootings. And plus, I understood, my training was in economics. And I, I realized that when you intentionally try to increase the price of something, you're going to increase the, the motivation to supply it. I started out to say that, you know, I used to think that there was the number of people that got killed that was going to end, it, you know, whether it was 12 in a weekend. But, and so for, for the first four or five years of my drug policy efforts, I thought, you know, it's, it's the killings in the poor areas. That, that's the most likely place for there to be change. Then one day I turned the radio on, and I happened to hear that there's an election going on in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and they've got about a $7 million, pop, seven million population base there. And they're killing 30 people a day. So you could turn the television on and watch the gun battles between the police and, and the drug cartels and between rival members of the drug cartels. 30 people were being killed a day, not 12 in a weekend. And they happened to have a reflection at the time, so they, they put on the broadcast by one of the candidates for mayor who says, we're going to get tough, we're going to crack down, take back our streets and, 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 and rescue these favelas, the poor areas down there. And then the, the second guy gets up and gives the first guy's speech. No difference. And then, then I realized, you know what, it doesn't matter how many people we kill a day in Chicago, how many people we kill a week. The people, for some reason, have the ability and the tolerance to with, withstand all of these curses of Job and, and go on with the same policy. And so my thinking changed uh, probably uh, back, back uh, about the turn of the century. And, and my feeling is now that the, the drug war is still absolutely certainly going to end. And the reason is because we can't pay the bills. We cannot pay the bills and keep this policy in place. That's the reason absolutely for certain. It's only a question of how many kids are going to kill, how many kids are going to be overdosed. Right now, a kid overdoses uh, and we're at a party or something. I can't take them to the hospital. I, I'm in trouble. If I'm the one who supplied him the drugs, I can't. I can't uh, be there. I can't. I can't hey, try and wait. You know what? Be right. I can't be involved. Okay. I make it worse. Pat. Pat. It was Pat. Pat Butler and then Charlie. Uh, you got the guy over there. Bill went. Yeah. Bill right. one. Yeah. Bill one. Yes, sir. I arrived. Uh, I arrived late. So maybe you covered this already. And I know I'm asking a silly question given the fact that we sell uh, cigarettes openly without consequence. But is there, are there any medical consequences, uh, serious medical consequences, from the frequent use of marijuana? Uh, there was a judge, Francis Young, who was commissioned by the DEA to do a comprehensive study and determine whether or not uh, marijuana was harmful or not harmful. And his conclusion was, after hearing hundreds of witnesses and all kinds of textbooks and experts, that, that, that it's more benign than alcoholic substances. Who paid him? Pardon? That's bullshit. Who paid him? Well, you, you're coming. You know, <laughs> you know, you know I, one, one of our members of the audience said that, that baloney, uh, if I heard it right. 
but the fact of the matter is, marijuana has been a plant that's been around and been used medicinally for millenniums. It, 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 it is uh, one of the most studied drugs uh, ever. Uh, I happen to know a girl by the name of Miyako Perez. She has a, 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 a now he's, he's older, but he was eight years old. Uh, the, the child was autistic. They lived in California. And, and her son looked at a chair and a person the same. He was autistic. He, he, he wouldn't eat. The, the child was eight years old and he weighed uh, some, some 50 pounds, 60 pounds. And the kid was starving to death. The doctor, the pediatrician, has got him on all this medicine, destroying his liver because he was taking so many medicines. So this, this mother, because she's being told your, your child's going to be dead in a month, she said, well, why don't we try marijuana? Because I've heard that people eat and their appetites improve with marijuana. And the pediatrician says, you know, you, you have an eight-year-old child. We can't give him marijuana. And the mother says, well, my son is dying. You're telling me he's dying. She says, I've never used marijuana in my life. But, but what am I going to do? So the doctor didn't approve it. She goes out and she finds the marijuana, bakes it into brownies. Within the, the, uh, a half an hour, hour of the time, the kid for the first time had marijuana baked into brownies. The, the kid's attitude changed. He looked at a person in the eyes like he was communicating. The, the kid, uh, his, his weight went from like 60 pounds to uh, dramatically increased. I forget the numbers, but like, uh, like close to 100 pounds. The, the, he, the kid was on the Martha Stewart show. This woman has now created the Unconventional Foundation for Autism with hundreds of people around the country uh, looking to her for help. All right, Charles. Yeah, Jim, yeah, you say you want to, you don't want to regulate drugs. You mean, like, you just could sell any kind of drugs you want, like uh, high pump alarm, uh, Chuck's Kickapoo juice. Uh, what do you mean by, are you going to sell, like, any potency of cocaine or just, you just kind of identify the, the question that. is, uh, is do the same regulations <coughs> and control for one drug fit all drugs? And the I mean, answer to that, of course, is no. LEAP has a, a statement of principles when one of the, the, the principles says that we need ro rules and regulations that are commensurate with the risk posed by the drug. So, for example, marijuana, which has very little risk or harm to persons, should have very uh, minute and control. Uh, whereas heroin is very harmful to persons, is very addictive, and so the regulations and control need to be much greater. Uh, 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 we've got people on methadone, which is a synthetic substitute for heroin, which is often used, uh, and, and with great results, where you don't have to inject it, it's usually taken orally, uh, where you can get it from meth clinics, method, methadone clinics in Illinois, which are lawful. Uh, and, and it's only in a very small percent of cases in Switzerland and Germany and uh, European countries and in, in uh, uh, I don't know if in Australia, but uh, for certain in European countries where uh, they're actually prescribed heroin, but the preference is to give them meth, uh, methadone. Uh, which, which is less expensive, less risky. It's still addictive. I had a guy come into my office. Uh, he said, are you the guy who writes those articles about drugs? Yeah. He's in a sheriff's uniform, and he said, you know, I've been working for the Cook County Sheriff's Office for the last 30-some years. He said, I'm a heroin addict. And he said, I take 75 milligrams of methadone a day, and I work with the kids at the Audi home, and the sheriff doesn't know that I'm uh, a heroin addict, or he wouldn't have the job. But he was able to carry on, be responsible, care, take care of children, be a county employee. So, so the, the regulations need to be commensurate with the risk that's posed. Does anyone else want to ask a first question? Yes. 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 If, if we want to stop the prohibition of drugs, or of marijuana at least, is, and, and we can't seem to do it through the United Nations or through the United States government. Is there a higher secret sort of um, um, political, is there something political beyond the United Nations, beyond the United States, 
that we would have to reach an appeal to. Uh, the question is, is there a, a court of review higher than the United Nations, uh, the United States Congress, and the Illinois General Assembly? And the answer is, if there is, I would already have been there. Uh, I used to think that leadership came from the top, and so I used to go to political leaders. I went to George Dunn and I said, uh, you know, we, we need to do something different with drug policy. And, and, uh, and I said, I want to run for state's attorney so I can do something about it. And uh, he, he said, well, we need a new sheriff. Why don't you run for sheriff? And I said, well, I can't do that from there. Uh, and, and, um, and he said, well, what are you going to do with drugs? And at the time, I thought, well, let's just legalize drugs for addicts only. We can attract addicts to the government. We'll use the confiscated drug dealers' wares. We'll package it, test it at the crime laboratory, and we'll give those drugs out to addicts only. So legalize drugs for addicts only. And I said, and then we'll give them this program, and then uh, we'll try to wean them off. And he said, well, and then what happens when you... Uh, when, when they continue to use and they're not being weaned off, what are you going to do then? I said, well, then we could, we could, uh, then I suppose we'll have to lock them up for a while. And he says, well, uh, so, so uh, the, the, you're basically going to still be putting them in prison. And, and that was really insightful because it, it's, it's the same problem. All right, Drug Walter policy needs has the last question. The last question. The final word. Final word. <laughs> uh, Oh, uh, Bill Wentz. I'm sorry. <laughs> Bill has not Did anyone been. not have a chance to ask a question? Bill Wentz. Oh, Bill. There was a, a, a constitutional amendment to prohibit alcohol. How come there hasn't been one for marijuana? <laughs> okay, well, it's an interesting uh, question. Uh, it was the people, through their legislatures, which prohibited uh, alcohol years ago. And uh, after they saw it didn't work some 14 years later, they demanded an end to it because people wanted their, uh, their alcohol. Uh, and, and so the politicians followed what the people wanted, and they rescinded it after only 14 years. This, this war on drugs came about not because the people demanded it, but because the politicians who were in place at the time saw this was a way to collect votes. It's a popular thing, so Republican and Democrats alike have all been in support of the Warren the Brothers. It wasn't the, the people, it wasn't through constitutional amendment, they just started passing these prohibitions. The, the Harrison Narcotics Act was put in place in 1914 uh, on a national basis, and it, it was designed only to regulate uh, uh, opium and, uh, and cocaine uh, initially, and then gradually that prohibition expanded. Uh, and, and, and then there was uh, like half a century that, that went into reaching uh, the prohibition of alcohol where there was this pressure, we need to pre prevent the guy from wasting his salary and ruining our lives and the domestic violence and so forth, and uh, there are evils that come with alcohol. But the evils didn't go away when we prohibited it. Instead we invented, as I say, the highball and, and, and uh, people were going blind from this stuff that was uncontrolled and unregulated. And, and, and this war on drugs just has continued to escalate without a constitutional amendment or the people uh, uh, well, putting it in They get away with it. Nobody's ever challenged us in court that I know of. Well, there have been many challenges to all, all kinds of parts of the, the war on drugs. Uh, the judge in Brazil from LEAP, uh, she declared uh, the personal consumption of drugs uh, was, was a constitutional right and the prohibition against it was against the constitution of Brazil. <laughs> uh, but no one in the United States has uh, 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 declared the, any well, Where does the government get the, get the authority oh, to... Uh, Rebuttals. We're going to have to cut off the question period. All right, let's and thank our speaker. Let's thank our speaker. How many here have some remarks to make on the subject? There are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 35 minutes. Well, each. maybe. Yeah. Let's split the difference and make uh, <laughs> Five minutes. So you don't have to take up the full five minutes, but up to five minutes you got. Okay. Don't forget that joint, man. Francisco Aguilar. Can I roast
<laughs> smoking dope. You want to go smoke dope? Here really, I think uh, besides uh, that we have mm -hmm. a lot of. It's only a dope now. I'm straight. We have a lot of addicts to, uh, yeah. to drugs, but we have more addicts to plastic shit. <laughs> <laughs> We have uh, been um, connived to work in fucking jobs that they mean nothing, that pays nothing, that takes our wealth and our health to make more plastic shit, with which we convince or through advertising convince people to play with. So we are playing with bullshit, with meaningless uh, things that have no future and no possible sustainability. And uh, when we encounter a problem like it was presented today, we take it as a joke. Uh, it's, it's, it's sad to see the reaction of some of the people who don't listen to the speaker but they keep in their mind whatever there is that is going inside them and couldn't listen at all what is being said. So the questions reflect that lack of attention or lack of willingness to listen to what has been said. The, the United States have the guts to try to make mate in Argentina and Uruguay, Paraguay, as an illegal drug, to regulate it like they would to regulate marijuana. I mean, they, they have no limit to their intention to control the world, to make this world a fascist dictatorship among all the borders. There is no borders that will be respected. There is a very strong uh, correlation between all these controls put into people. For example, we have one of our attendees sometimes who is so fascinated with some of these Asian countries that they are so prosperous and, and so uh, business-like and capitalist size. And in those countries, you get penalties for not flushing the toilet in a public bathroom. And this is how people live, scared of their own shadows. And this is what we live in here. As, as uh, movements like Occupy Chicago or Occupy Wall Street take a little bit of, a <coughs> of importance, then the police and the mayor of the city of Chicago and many others start upping the ante and giving the police more weapons and more powers to embarrass and, and harass the people who are protesting. So we are confronting a real serious issue. But besides being addicted to drugs and to plastic shit, we are very much addicted to energy. This, this energy that we are getting here, photons coming from these slides, they were originated by billions of years of accumulation of photons coming from the sun. And we are burning this at 5,000 times the speed at which these were accumulated. It's not sustainable. We are addicted to this, but eventually, we will have to hang up the coat and start living within our means. You guys would like to talk a lot. Well, I think just a couple of things. One, is that all these things are symptoms of a bigger problem. The gangs are a symptom, the drugs are a symptom, the collapse of mission and sense of purpose. So you can't take any one of these things as an individual thing and then link them to other things and try to solve it from the bottom up. You have to solve it from the top down. Now, 
We have banking re uh, regulations, Glass-Steagall to be one of them that was dismantled in 99. You reimpose Glass-Steagall, you have now a bankruptcy audit going on in all the banks in the United States. And anybody who doesn't want to, want to do business with the United States, they, like the offshore operations, we can cut those off. But internally to the United States, we can have that audit. And you can separate the real from the bogus, the derivatives, it's also all the drug money. And there's laws of the books that anything over $10,000 that's not accounted for, well, put it under question. You can trace it. Now, he showed pictures here of the guy swimming in the paper. Well, that's a big problem. How do you launder all that money? The guy on the street is not using credit cards. He's not using checks. It's all in paper. So what's he do with it? You need a mechanism to launder it. That's where the banks come in, and that's what's running our country from these outside sources of power, like the whole British um, inter-alpha banking crew that's now broke, and it's blowing out in Europe, and it's blowing out here. So if you put through glass people, not only can you deal with that drug money laundering operation, you can actually set it up so you can begin crediting projects, like this huge Nawapa project, water project. You put 10 million people to work, part of that is going to be 2 to 3 million idle young people. Even more than that, as you build them under the Army Corps of Engineers, as you bring these, these military guys back home, you actually set up a structure whereby you're educating, like Roosevelt did, teaching and training and getting these guys a trade. Now, if you start this NOWAPA plan, you need so much concrete, steel, you name it. There's 380 projects ready to go since 1960. So if we decide to do it tomorrow morning, we flush the Obama policy, we'd flush the Republican policy, we'd start this, you'd need to start putting literally four to eight million people work. Eight million in terms of the total amount, four million in terms of the gear up of the projects, and then you'd have the whole machine tool operation going through to work in the United States, building the components. So that's a reality. We started tomorrow morning. That's why LaRouche is not covered. Now that's got to be the policy right now. And what happens in these kinds of discussions, they pick a particular, and they say, look how terrible it is, we need to legalize it. Well, the legalization of drugs is run by the same people who run the drugs. It's the propaganda end. It's the protection operation. So you've been just a course here. You had a course now in gang counterbang. Gang counter gang. You play both sides, there's no solution. So who's ever involved in it may not be aware of that, but that's what's the controlling operation from the top. So let's bankrupt the whole bunch with Glass-Steagall. Let's put the credits into production. Let's get these kids back into science. And let's stop this nonsense of trying to debate whether we should drug our kids or let them kill themselves or send them to wars. Or now even with this president conducting a thermonuclear war shortly for this idiotic British banking policy. Put it through a bankruptcy reorganization and start now. But that's the subject in the nation, and not some debate academically whether we should legalize it or not. It's a bogus issue. We're not going under because of the debt from drugs. We're going under because we paid $30 trillion bailing out banks that have been laundering drug money and running derivatives for decades. We have a hundred a thousand trillion dollars in deficits of these derivatives based on nothing that we're paying. And Glass-Steagall says it's not ours. It's theirs, let them eat it. And they say, well, you'll go under. So we won't. Gear up the credit policy and build this project. I got some copies of it, you can grab it later. But don't take the Mutt and Jeff game as some simple little thing that we can do fix legally. We gotta fix the mission and purpose of the nation, and we gotta do it now before this election. Yeah. This is cool. Fix this country, man. Uh, the speaker introduced himself. I'm gonna introduce myself in a similar fashion. I smoked pot for 30 years. Uh, I uh, did all kinds of drugs. I experimented with LSD, I experimented with uh, all kinds of stuff. And uh, the two drugs that may be the sickest that, that just about killed me were nicotine and alcohol. And of the most disgusting, sickening bunch of morons I ever had to in my life, that would have to be alcoholics. 
Now, I, I hung out with, uh, with meth addicts, I hung out with uh, smack heads, I hung out with every kind of drug addled personality you can imagine. The most disgusting, stupid, ignorant, uh, I, I just, there's no words to describe these kinds of people. We're alcoholics every time. Okay, having said that, I would like to ask you a question, and that is, what the hell right does anybody got to tell me what I can ingest? If I pick a leaf off a plant and smoke it, why is it business of yours? Why is my freedom subject to your whim as to whether or not I can smoke a weed? Because oh, drug addicts are in a society. That this is not for you to decide what I can do. Excuse me. I'm not going to tell you stop eating that sandwich because I believe it's morally wrong. If I am smoking pot and you are over there, you have no right, in my opinion, to tell me, put that thing down. It's some kind of societal monstrosity for me to do what I want with my body that I don't think and no proof has ever been offered that it does any harm. Excuse me, okay? It is a question, as several speakers have brought up, of personal freedom. Are we free or are we not? Do we have the power over our own bodies to do what we please with them as long as it obeys one basic edict, is that, that is, my freedom ends where yours begins, okay? If I'm in free, in, interfering with your freedom, with my pot smoking, which I don't do anymore anyway, how is it that you have the right to tell me to stop? That, that's, that's my question for you. If you can answer that, great. But I'm not going to believe it anyway. All right, thank you. First of all, I want to thank the, the speaker, finally, a voice of a rational voice. Um, and uh, I'm in total agreement with your thinking, uh, which is both uh, based on values and, and on uh, common sense. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to address some of the questions and the issues that, that were brought here. Um, somebody asked about how many jobs or how does it help the economy. Uh, all those jobs that are related to uh, the drugs are negative jobs, if, if you will, in terms of they're unproductive. Um, of course, with what we would have saved on, on uh, legalizing or non-criminalizing drugs, we can create, like, like the speaker has pointed out, a lot of very productive jobs, um, not, not only in education, but in any other field, which will make the, uh, the society grow rather than suffocate. Um, and uh, this is not theory. If we look at Western Europe, I think Netherlands has, has reported lately that it closed 80% of their prisons and laid off, I don't know how many thousands of guards, because there's no business. Uh, they are simply permissive. They, not, they don't criminalize the, uh, uh, the fields of pleasure. Uh, prostitution and drugs, and uh, there's just not enough crime. So, uh, and they're doing very well economically uh, otherwise in terms of uh, closing the gaps between uh, the poor and the rich. So, uh, here is another example of, of the kind of thinking that um, the paradoxical thinking of uh, less pressure. Uh, less crime and less drug use. Um, cocaine, uh, by the way, you ask the question, if you take the profit out of cocaine, um, you will reduce the, the incentive of pimping and seducing. So
so uh, the reason that children are, are so seduced yeah. is because it is such a private, a, a, a profitable area. Uh, plants, yeah, I think it's a good idea to have a plant on the balcony, on my condo, on the fourth floor. Everyone should have a plant. First of all, we would be much more calm and relaxed. Although I wonder if we would conquer the uh, human nature altogether, and if it, we won't start a fight, my my plant is bigger than yours. <laughs> <laughs> but the issue, basically, the the issue that uh, of uh, free will, free will is much of an illusion. Um, but you are right. The, the last speaker here is right in terms of moralizing. We are moralizing um, pleasure, uh, drugs uh, especially, um, whereas we need to look at them rationally and, and um, assess the, uh, the pros and cons of suffering and wellness that they really bring rather than uh, um, sticking with the principle. Um, so, um, and so is obedience. Obedience and compliance to the law, too, has become like a higher principle than the content of, of what we are uh, obeying or complying to. And that kind of thinking is very hard to change. Uh, and in addition to the corruption at higher levels, and I agree, um, uh, that is a, a very, very hard fight to 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 struggle with. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our speaker very, very much. And I also want to point out that what he says goes in the direction of the print, one of the prime principles on which this country was founded, libertarianism. I want to take this. I want to take this opportunity to give this poster to our speaker, and anyone here who would like one can see me sometime after the meeting. Uh, they're available for ten dollars each, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. As usual, I'm going to be very controversial tonight. Of course I'm going to be my own self, but I'm going to tell you, I think this guy's policy is going to absolutely work. Why do I say that? Look at this product here. We all know what step on the installment plan, but I've chosen to ingest it in my body, and it's legal. But it's regulated heavily. I can't take it out here and uh, light up without offending a few people and committing a small capital offense in the city of Chicago or in the thing. And by rights, you know, you guys have a right to clean air. Yay, so I have to take it outside. However, if we completely ban the sale of cigarettes, I'd probably be one of the first to start producing them illegally. Because I have used it quite a bit. The thing that I really want to make clear is that because of the fact that we already have the example of alcohol, which you can get legally almost anywhere, but you have to get a license, you have to have certain regulations and rules followed, and the fact that we've completely changed our attitudes on smoking with some laws and regulations and maybe some restrictive covenants or whatnot, it's still legal for me to ingest, but I don't have to offend anybody anymore with it. So I would think that with the two precedents there, our speaker may have a point. Legalize it tax it, and perhaps we may be better off. As a matter of fact, if I was a banker on Wall Street right now, I would be basically saying to these cartels, hey, you know, guys, we're missing out on the boat to bail ourselves out. We should be uh, 
legalizing this stuff, pushing our lobbyists for it, and then, of course, we now have another source of legal profit. Why not start the investment firm of the, you know, smoke cigarettes and booze and drugs? It probably would make a killing. I mean, look at what the government's done now with the numbers racket. The lottery, as we call it. And legalized gambling. Hey, you know, vice does pay. And with a little bit of a regulated markets, it could probably really, really work. Thank you. All right. All right. Let's thank our speaker again for my PowerPoint articulating well with his views on the matter. As usual, I'll be eclectic and a little bit unusual. I'm going to be early. Uh, let's see here. Your basic premise, your approach to legislation. Uh, we do not approach the laws of our society strictly on a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, facts and figures and things like that. Uh, I'm sorry, we're not some sort of monetary transactions. It, it's not the central element of how our society operates. This is not quite that capitalist a system yet. And I hope we never reach that level. Uh, we reserve drug use and drug addiction, addiction is not ever done in isolation. And as till such time as you can achieve that, which is hypothetically impossible, it is of concern to the rest of us. Stop so your smoking. basic premise is wrong. Yeah, stop smoking. Now, any more than an, an alcoholic is not a poor, no longer an individual, or no longer a member of our society. We're no longer the responsibility of our society. Other the care or deserving of the care and treatment of our society. And the same thing is in this. So keep that in mind. Don't be hooting and hollering this stuff here. I'm doing what I want to do. As long as it doesn't impinge upon the rest of us. And to the extent that it impinges upon the rest of us, yes, sir, we are going to have a, a voice in what, in fact, you do do. Now, I don't want to hear any of this big brother who will do what I did. Honestly, this is not the Stamp Act. Now, that's ridiculous. Oh my God, we're going to live in the, the, oh, you know, Nazi Germany or something like this. Uh, no, extended drug use is not a neutral activity. I have the unfortunate duty of providing fair representation to any number of peoples over the years who are substance abusers. And no, this is the cautious thing you approach. Uh, I, I can give you an example. Once, Ryan, an employee, he worked 42 years. And I'm going to leave a lot out of this story. He was so, so spaced out of it, I filled out his retirement papers. And there's questions and things on things like this. He wasn't capable of giving it. I even had to pull in some markers because he was already technically fired. And that's what you have to deal with sometimes with these things. This is serious business. Say, well, we're gonna, we're just gonna open it up, la di da di da. I think there's a thing called unintended consequences here. I'm sorry, that there, there, are, there are the results, and that's where I think I kind of like, you know, I'm with you, but you, you, you're kind of like on what it is you're going to legalize, and what's going to happen if we do legalize it. That's what I want to see happen here. Now, regarding marijuana, I'm going to tell you a story out of college. I, I lived in the, went to live in rural areas, and in Kansas, marijuana was in fact growing all over the place. It, it, is, a, it is a difficult to plant to control, as a matter of fact. Um, the highway department had a hard time because we had dirt unpaved roads. And it would start clogging in the roads. This stuff, I guess that's a category of plants that are hardy and growable. So it's really neat. Now the last thing I want to talk about, and the real reason I want to talk about, is I heard some belly aching at the independent voters of Illinois the other night. And I heard it again tonight. 
Because you people don't like speed cameras. Well, too bad. As a pedestrian, I like speed cameras. You want to know why? Because every morning, I have to cross Archer Avenue. And there's about four or six lanes. There's even Yahoo's. This amazes me. You think they slow down for pedestrians? We have to cross over. There's no lights there or anything. No. They don't do that. Now, the one thing I want with speed cameras is you Yahoo's in your cabs. If you get caught speeding, I want double. You guys are supposed to be professional drivers. No. It's a serious issue. Let me tell you why. Statistically, if, if you get hit by a car, at 20, I'm in the transportation, a little bit in field here. You get hit by a car at 25 miles per hour, there's virtually no chance that it's going to be a fatal accident. Maybe only 5% of the time. If you go up, let's say, 40 miles per hour, you know what happens? Just the opposite. Do you have any chance of surviving? Almost none. You want to go up to 65 and all that? No, this is serious business. Now, if you want to trade, listen, which is more important, Chuck's public safety or your right to speed? All right. <laughs> <laughs> now, until you conduct yourself like responsible drivers, I say there should be more speed cameras everywhere possible. Thank you very much. I need to sound like a real Nazi. Give some reason why we are where we are as a country and a citizen of this country. I tried to do this last week, but they cut me off because I thought I had five minutes. They said I had three. But anyway, I looked for, uh, arrived at the conclusion, like Sot and Russell, that man is the problem. I know why man is the problem, and that's because the few have to do what they have to do to control the mess. Now, I came to these conclusions when I familiarized myself with the classic, you know, the hurt his eyes, the Pentile, and the homer. And when I read the Old Testament, I found out that, hey, they just stealing from the classics, the, the ports and so forth. Then it dawned on me that this was a uh, man action. I mean, this didn't come out of the truth. This was premeditated, and so, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Now, after the Old Testament, then we end up with Christianity. Now, Christianity came 400 years after Christ died, and guess what? People like Charlemagne, Constantine, and others, they got tired, they did today. They said, listen, I can take this, what I, that came from, starting with the, 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 the poets, that, didn't premeditate, they were just creating that. I'm a fan of the Bridging Port Port. And they taking customs, uh taking Christ and turn him into Christianity and man, if you look I never seen such a success in all my life. I mean, every millions of people is still falling for the marketplace where they sell freedom, religion, propaganda, uh, protection, etc. I call it the Truman Show because it's fiction and man created it. And we move from 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 the uh, Christianity and we go to the philosopher like like the, uh, Thomas Hobbes and, 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 and John Russo and Locke and so forth. And, and Hobbes was talking about the state of, of, of nature and that man needs to have a social contract because he ain't good enough to do these things without injuring himself and other people. Locke agreed because he said that you, was, you have no innate ability, that you're born with a clean slate, and other men's got to lead you around, and he agreed with uh, uh, Hobbes because he said we need a third party in force, the pursuit of happiness and the pursuit of property. Now we change that to pursuit of happiness in our constitution. And uh, 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 Rousseau, taking the uh, state of nature, and he kind of moved it on with a little more finance than John Hobbes and so forth. Now, I left out one that I'm coming to now. The next influence on the Truman Show was 
the pseudo science with his pseudo side. I mean, the pseudo scientists with his pseudo side. And the people, the few, that have to control the masses and they have to create it from fiction. There's no proof about nobody behind the cloud. They didn't have no proof, but they sold it. <laughs> oh, millions and millions of people bought it. The same way with the pseudo scientists spreading pseudo. I mean, pseudo scientists spread pseudo science. They use that just like they use uh, 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 Christianity, and like they use other things for the masses. Now, how can you complain when you allow another man to be your God or whatever he is? You got to be what Nietzsche intended you to be. You got to be the over man. Now, I'm a, a anarchist, and I'm an anarchist because. I can see that a man, another man, is nothing but my equal. He can't tell me a goddamn thing because he's my equal. And how do I know that? Because his monkey ass is going to Rose Hill Cemetery just like I am. And when individuals wake up and stop bothering assholes around and letting them use the Truman Show to conduct them in a way that is benefit for them, well, you ain't, you ain't conducting me. I got my own mind, and I do my own fucking thinking. Now, do I have to go up in the mountain like Buddha in order to prove that you ain't leading me around? Do I have to throw a bomb to, to, to let you know I'm an anarchist? No, 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 no. You can't do my thinking. I do my own thinking. And therefore, I can exist simultaneous with the Truman Show without being a part of it. And those problems that people wring their hands about, I know all about them. And therefore, therefore, when you get rid of the problem, you have to get rid of the man that you think is a saint. When they get home, they can't vote because they're felons. When they're out there in the boondocks, and we just had our decennial census, they're not counted as resident of where they're really from. They're counted as a resident out where the prison is. So one of the effects of the war on drugs, a, a sort of fortuitous spin-off, is that it increases House representation in Washington from the red states and decreases the pool of eligible voters in the blue states. Shut down. <laughs> Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, thank our uh, speaker uh, for uh, a very exceptionally interesting program this evening. Um, I have long suspected that probably we make a big mistake by going after uh, people for possession of things like marijuana. Uh, I don't know what our policy should be toward the stronger drugs. Uh, I certainly don't mean this to suggest that I'm in favor of legalizing heroin or opium or any of that, but I do think that we ought to take a close look at legalizing and controlling marijuana. Um, the reason I asked the question that I did, whether there were any known medical consequences uh, to this, um, we've all, or most of us, have seen or heard of the movie that came out in the late 1930s, Reefer Madness, <laughs> where anyone who took a puff 
uh, was going to immediately become some sort of a sex crazed necrophiliac zombie, uh, you know, unfit for human society. Um, we know that's not a fact because I suspect there may be a couple people in this room who have at one time or another sampled the weed. Um, I'd like, I'd like a study, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not suggesting for a moment we should all sample that and spend the rest of our lives in a state of zonkiness. Um, I am suggesting that we take a hard, clear look at what the drug does do and does not do. Uh, let's put the myths aside. Uh, let's uh, look very carefully at what are the long-term effects. Are there residual effects from marijuana over a period of time? Uh, does a person who is smoking marijuana, uh, is he any more dangerous on the road uh, than a person who takes the occasional glass of wine? What? I don't know. I'm asking these questions. Why did you ask the bus driver tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm asking these questions because I'd really like to see a serious study on which uh, legislators could base their uh, future lawmaking uh, direction. Um, it's been done every 20 years for over a century. Well, has, you know, do we, do we do we have enough scientific evidence at this time to confidently and safely legalize the drug? I know it's absurd to ask that question because we do legalize cigarettes, which if used as directed are guaranteed to kill you in a period of time. Uh, uh, there's no question about that. We do know that uh, alcoholic beverages, while beneficial at a certain level, uh, can at the same time kill you or at least put you in a very sorry state for the rest of your life. We know that. What do we know about marijuana that could be taken before a legislative body and presented and enable us as a society to look at this rationally? We are beginning to recognize that marijuana has medicinal value. I have uh, a friend of mine who is a prosecutor in California who uses medical marijuana. Um, what was really funny, when I was there about three or four years ago, um, they were having a party by the swimming pool, and uh, the police chief, deputy police chief of Los Angeles, uh, this prosecutor, um, a guy from the mayor's office, and several other people hmm. were sitting around, passing around the weed. Now, <laughs> none of them were wild maniacs, all of them were perfectly rational, and the only reason I refused to take uh, a puff was because of the fact that I knew within a week I was going to be called on to take a urine test. I was at that time, believe it or not, up for consideration for a job in the Blagojevich administration which fortunately never materialized. You know, they say, be careful what you ask for, you may get it. This was one time when someone was definitely looking out for me in the great beyond and making sure that I didn't get what I thought I wanted because I am sure at a certain point I would have been before an investigating committee and they would have been asking me all kinds of questions I really was not in a position to easily answer. Anyway, I think that's my sign to uh, leave. And uh, anyway, I think we should give this some thought. Uh, let's be rational about this. Let's approach this intelligently. Let's do what's right by ourselves and our country. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah, good stuff. <coughs> and what I want to do is I'll make a comment about your prediction about how they're going to run out of money, and I'll use that as a segue into broader considerations. It's possible that they will see to it that for this that they never run out of money. And the reason that it's possible is the, the prison industrial complex. 
in other words, it, what seem, what's going on in this country, it seems to me, is that the elites are increasingly able to get away with putting their narrow short-term interests ahead of everything else. And so if building more prisons will get you more campaign contributions from, for starters, contractors who build prisons, okay, then, um, you know, and, and whoever else gets in on the gravy train of the prison industrial complex one way or the other, the politicians can ever increasingly count on the media to sit it out and the public interest to get lost in the shuffle of their coverage of Chandra Levy and Michael Jackson and Nicole Brown Simpson, etc. Now, in the days of Prohibition, we still had at least arguably a functioning media which was capable of telling the people something of the truth of the consequences of Prohibition of alcohol. And so within uh, 14 years, the people were aroused to, to, to force the politicians to make a change. Now, leading the people, for the politicians to lead the people around by the nose is a virtual piece of cake. And mention was made of the movie Reefer Madness, and I'm tempted to say stuff like that was in its way a hard work. As it turned out, Reefer Madness became famous for being camp, for being so ridiculously um, a caricature. Um, of marijuana smoking. But that showed where we were going. And there are those who take the view that the increasing orgies of malgovernance, of the governance, of which the war on drugs is only a part, it's happening all over in all sorts of segments from the banking the situation. Um, someone or a speaker earlier mentioned that. Frank alluded implicitly to peak oil and the hear no evil, see no evil of society toward peak oil. You just can go on and on and on. Um, the view I get from a certain author named John Ralston Saul is that what has happened is that audiovisual media centralized in radio networks, TV networks, has bastardized public debate and seen to it that the critics of establishment policy have a harder and harder time getting the word in that job. So guys like you can come to a place like a college and this thing will get put on the web. Yeah, and among what, millions or billions of websites? Whereas the Charles Krauthammers and the David Broders and all those types who pay lip service to the war on drugs and then move on, pretty much, isn't that how it goes? Okay, those guys get on every week or whatever in the specific case, Tim Russ or all of those types. Have you seen one? They, they grow like weeds. And it's just the same old see no evil, hear no evil stuff. And their paymasters are doing fine, and they're doing fine. And so let's just keep on going the same old way. Well, as Frank points out, it's unsustainable as hell. But that doesn't matter, because in the meantime, they've got theirs, and those who would point out the incestuous relationships among these various players. Those folks don't get a word in edgewise. And I just know, that's, you know, when I asked about the drift toward totalitarianism, whenever you have a sleeping public, <laughs> and when you have the high-tech capacity to have speed cameras of the sort that Chuck is in love with, yeah, we've got speed cameras to, to watch the rabble speed, but we don't have many cameras <laughs> In when the politicians are meeting their contributors and telling us what's going on there now. And it's stuff like that. The deals that get done behind closed doors, you know, they very rarely get written about. Maybe they'll take out a Blagojevich or a George Ryan every now and then for whatever reason. But in the main, it's business as usual. But oh doggone it, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have the cameras look at the drug deals at the corner of State Madison and Lincoln and Damon and so on. Because that's, yeah, 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 we're going to concentrate there. But the really big deal's going down. No, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're going to get to go. It's all going to be hear no evil and see no evil when it comes to that stuff. And, yeah, I do. If, if you can keep the people asleep, you can do anything to them. And that, I fear, is where it's going to keep on going. Thank you. Okay, well, I want to thank our speaker for an outstanding uh, presentation. Very articulate, well prepared, uh, interesting, uh, and rational. Uh,
someone else said, spot on. I want to address the fellow in the back there that said that uh, what he ingests is not necessarily my business. Well, you know, just about a month ago, my next door neighbor ingesting two legal drugs, alcohol and cigarettes, the dumbass fell asleep with a cigarette on his couch. And, uh, of course, the cigarette fell down in, the, in between the couch cushions and set the damn couch on fire. And luckily, you know, he woke up and uh, was able to get these cushions outside and the, the smoldering uh, uh, comforter that was on it. But, you know, it just smelled the place up something ferrous and uh, stunk for days. It was all smoky. I mean, I really wanted to just, you know, just punch this guy in the mouth. But I felt sorry for him. He's kind of pathetic, so I, I didn't. And uh, thankfully now he's been evicted. So, uh, but yes, even these legal drugs, you know, come with, uh, you know, there's, you know, they, they, they impact other people. Uh, that said, however, though, I, I do, uh, uh, you know, subscribe more or less to, to the idea that, uh, you know, what if it doesn't break my leg or pick my pocket, you know, I really don't care. And it brings up to mind, you know, what the role of government should be. Now, I just went to this uh, excellent uh, debate Wednesday night at the Hyatt between Yaron Brook from the uh, Ayn Rand Institute yeah. and, uh, oh. and some socialists like David Callahan. I don't know where he's from. But it was an excellent. Were you there, sir? Were you there at the debate? Oh, anyway, it was excellent. And essentially, uh, you know, uh, what Aaron Brooks' point was, was that government should be the only institution or tool of society licensed to use force. Oh. Everything else should be basically, you know, mutually beneficial agreements that people arrive at, you know, privately. And, you know, we should not be using force on each other. The government should use force, and that force should always be used to protect the people, not in really against the people. Now, so basically that brings the role of government to essentially providing for the common defense, including, you know, police, and enforcing contracts, you know, the judicial system. <laughs> and this is hillbilly militia talk. Everything that else. the government is not violent. I'm everything, trying to listen to them. Everything no, else. No, that's, that's bullshit. Please, I'm trying to listen to the man. Get out of here then. No, they One fool at a time. One fool at a time. Everything else no. is pretty much able to be done by the private sector. <laughs> and so, you know, do we want the gov a continually large government encroaching on more and more yeah, things? We've got government and education, right. government and energy, government and this, government and that, government. You know, just you know, too much government. Too much and this is what, this is what we have. Yeah. Now, how are we going to be able to unwind this master? You see the problem they're having in Greece when they try to get rid of government employees. And look what's happened to, to Governor Walker in Wisconsin when he tries to reduce the power of government employee uh, unions. You see the trouble he's going through. How are we going to unwind all this? Now, there's a great book. I can't remember the author's name. But I actually have it on my shelf. Uh, I wanted to read it, give a, uh, a speech here on it somebody called License to Steal. Have you, have you heard of it, uh, sir? Oh, have you heard of that book, yeah, yeah. License to Steal? Um, and essentially, uh, <clears throat> these small towns down in, uh, uh, you know, mostly in the south, there's a lot of small towns that really have no government money. I mean, these are little hick towns. And <clears throat> they plant a sheriff, uh, you know, on a county road or near a highway ramp, and they sit there and wait for a nice car to go by, usually with a person of color. Cash cows. And then they pull them over and search the car, hoping to find drugs or money. A lot of times they find money, and you know what? They can, they can take that money. Seize the evidence. Exactly. It's up to you to prove that, you know, it's for a legitimate purpose and not for an illegitimate purpose. He'd be talking and, about uh, down south. And uh, anyway, and these and these uh, these little these little towns and these little sheriff's departments, you know, these guys got real sophisticated equipment. They got brand new squad cars. They got these Taj Mahal buildings built. They are not going to give that up easy, folks. They're going to want to hang on to that. And unfortunately, a lot of innocent people get caught in the trap. And there's, there are people that deal with cash. There's still a lot of people that, there's people that have, uh, you know, are on their way to a building supply place to buy materials to rebuild their house that's hurt in a hurricane. They might have $10,000 cash on them. A lot of them don't have credit cards or things or don't want to use credit. And they, they get trapped in these dragnets and uh, their money gets confiscated. They've got to pay a lawyer $2,500 $2, to get it back. Now, 
I've got a friend, a real estate speculator, who lives on the west side, and uh, I asked him about what he felt about the, the drug uh, drugs being legal. He says, no, he wants to keep a bill legal. So he said the west side will, will get lit on fire overnight if drugs are legalized, because all these people will be unemployed, there'll be nothing uh, for them to do. So he wants to keep drugs illegal. <laughs> The next speakers have two well, minutes per person in order to allow the final rebuttal. Right, I think yeah, it's I, I, I don't usually say good things about government, no, but by and large, I think alcohol regulations are, are pretty sensible. And they could be adapted with rather little modification to the marijuana problem. And a speaker is saying that this problem will only come to an end when the government runs out of money, I'm afraid a few other problems are only going to come to an end when the government runs out of money. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of war and transportation bulldoggles. And as far as uh, I did come across a federal district court case from the 1930s, which said that the federal government had no authority to uh, uh, prohibit drugs. They had to have this 18th Amendment to prohibit alcohol, but they never done any. Uh, speaker, I think it's answer to why they have to have, don't have to have a marijuana amendment, prohibition amendment. I think it was quite unsatisfactory. I can't remember the name of the case. I can't remember the citation. I can look it up. Maybe I find it in a few days. But uh, I think there has also been in the rebuttals anyway some discussion of why we can't discuss these things rationally. And that's a problem in a few other areas too. Uh, Okay. But anyway, uh, you might catch the uh, okay. uh, final chapter that Ken Burns uh, PBS thing on prohibition. Well, they were capable of discussing things rationally toward the end of prohibition. And I don't see it in, in a bunch of a lot of areas today, and I. I have to complain every once in a while, we don't really have it here either. Well, I'll leave it like that, Bill. Put it in the thing. Or the other one. Put it in that the other one there. No, don't lay it like that. It'll roll off. Okay. Well. Rob, we have less than five minutes. We've got to... We have very little time. Uh, uh, I got to go get stoned. Uh, mentioned that uh, Jesus said, Ah, yeah, Jesus, yes. Yes, Jesus <laughs> said, that it's not what goes into the mouth that makes one unclean, but what comes out of the mouth, uh, curses and uh, insults and uh, blasphemies. Uh, Lies, lies about other people, uh, and so on. Uh, but I don't think he was talking about methamphetamines, which are, uh, which are darn dangerous. And I, I hope that uh, with good sense, and I think uh, some good sense has been uttered tonight, uh, we will have something uh, more sense about what is ingested. First of all, with regard to the comment that was made earlier about how the Roosevelt supposedly uh, made all their money from the opium trade, they did not. Um, Charlie. Don't take my time away. Sit down and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> the people who 
made their money from the opium trade were the Delano's, including Franklin Roosevelt's grandfather, who was indeed an opium tra a trader at one point. But the idea that Franklin Roosevelt, his father James Roosevelt, or anyone else in the Roosevelt family made money from the opium trade is bullshit, plain and simple. Yeah. Uh, with regard to the comment that was made earlier about how, well, if I adjust something, it's nobody's business but mine, for the most part, that's true. But having said that, if somebody lights up a, t a cigarette, tobacco, near me, and the secondhand smoke starts blowing in my direction, I think I have a right to object to that. Of course you do. And I certainly will. Um, and people who use those things need to understand, as was pointed out earlier, that you don't live in a vacuum and you have to live with the rest of society regardless of whether you personally happen to like that or not. Finally, with regard to the comments that were made earlier about how can we go back to some long ago time where things were, were better and blah, blah, blah. Well, I have, as I have said before, and I fear I must say again, my good friend Bob Matter, I think would be more comfortable in an era where somebody like Benjamin Harrison or Grover Cleveland was still president of the United States. Thank you. The speaker gets the last word. The speaker gets the last word. And I'd like to thank you for a fine presentation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I just want to. I'll help you. Here, hang on, hang on. Where you're holding it. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I want to uh, thank you all very much for the attention. Uh, you, you certainly were a good audience, an interesting audience. Uh, uh, you certainly understand the issues, I can tell based on uh, the comments that have been made. Uh, I would just leave you with the thought that the war on drugs has really harmed all of us in one way or another. It continues to harm society, it continues to harm children, it, it, it harms the moral fabric I think, of the world. Um, it, it, uh, it, it has economic impact in so many different ways that only a return to tolerance, and understanding, patience with one another's uh, faults uh, and addictions um, and treating one another like we care about one another will uh, again return the United States and the world to some semblance of reasonableness, uh, health, welfare, less drug use, less crime, uh, less of the things that we would all like to get rid of. So uh, with that short uh, thank you Al. All right. Thank you. All right.